Ay, ay. I'm too cool for the rules, baby, get off of me Never need no push, I do it all for me Keep a couple real hitters, got them on call for me Money moving, got it in the market where it ought to be Too true for the flex, baby, don't cap to me Drop 50, bring 150 right back to me Keep a couple real hitters, got them on call for me Money moving, got it in the market where it ought to be Look, Papa don't preach, teachers don't teach, niggas gon' reach, that's facts I ain't worried about none of that shit, I'm making that cash that Bunch of O's like NASCAR, but it's really more like NASDAQ Why they thinking that they hot shit when they really more like ass crack? Quarter on me like a referee, niggas hating what they'll never be Small top with a big bottom, yeah, shot is shaped like a letter D Let her have it, then I let it be, if you love it, gotta let it grow Crazy cause you really never know, when I'm hurting, never let it show I'm a two-tone, two-phone, two-chain New thing lame with, but you a broke ass, low class, no cash, certified lame nigga. I been getting to it like I ought to. Couldn't pick, so I bought two. Understand why your chick came? I'm just trying to figure why she brought you. I'm really reppin' and I'm flexed up, and I ain't gotta tell him I'm next up. Sleep on a the nigga, they rest up, but I'm up and I'm getting my checks up. Me and the fellas be high to propellers, ain't shit you could tell us we great nigga. Looking at niggas like how do you figure unless you been talk about a figures? I'm too cool for the rules, baby, get off of me. Never need no push, I do it all for me Keep a couple real hitters, got them on call for me Money moving, got it in the market where it ought to be Too true for the flex, baby, don't cap to me Drop 50, bring 150 right back to me Keep a couple real hitters, got them on call for me Money moving, got it in the market where it ought to be Look how we litty, we turned up the city, we raising a bar height I been finessing, just look at them stressing, yeah, they been on all night Sipping this water with somebody, daughter, she take what I taught her and build on it Came in this game on that shit that they ain't in a couple years later, we still on it Niggas be hating on it, bitches be waiting on it like a new season I bet an acre on it, I put some paper on it like I'm loose leafing Buying them assets, build me a cash net, I can fall in Look at my last bit, ain't got a tiptoe, hoe, I'm all in Think on a level that can't fail, and I roll me a J with the hate mail Been doing good on the merch sale, all this bread on me look like a Bake sale. Tell a young nigga what's really good. I'll be really good on a jaw jack. Send an email about the bread. I'ma hit you back with the car back. I'm too cool for the rules, baby. Get off of me. Never need no push. I do it all for me. Keep a couple real hitters. Got them on call for me. Money moving. Got it in the market where it ought to be. Too true for the flex, baby. Don't cap to me. Drop 50, bring 150 right back to me. Keep a couple real hitters, got them on call for me Money moving, got it in the market where it ought to be How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? Sweet! Hit that like button, let me know where you guys checking in from Not gonna keep you guys here long tonight Just gonna come chop it up with you Brief little lecture I got And we gonna, we gonna get out of here How's everybody doing? It's been a minute about a week. Uh, had an Easter weekend. So when I do my last live stream, it was Thursday night, right? We did the box truck business for dummies, right? That's what we did. Shout out to Shannon Sotomayor. Mark, what's good? What's good? Kenosha in the building. What's going on? Craig Freeman, shout out to all the MGMs. Shout out to the moderators. JB, what's going on? William Sweet, Roger Lacey. How's everybody doing? Uh, shout out to Pippi. Shout out to SD Walk. Inside the Square Circle, what's going on? Kevin Birch, uh, represent Texas by the way of Chicago. We're going to give him a Chicago bomb. Because he, he is from Chicago, even though he lives in Texas. So shout out to him. Great Polo, what's going on? It's D Walk. Box Truck Green, what's going on? Box Truck Green say he just got home, been out 22 days. That's what's up. Sober living with Dwayne. Glad you good, fam. Been a minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Marcellus, what's up? Interstate School, D Town in the building, Jordan, Minnesota. Jay Alexander, Cleveland in the building. All right, so boom. Sorry I'm late. I was on the members only. We was cooking up. Um, so I was streaming. I just wasn't streaming here. I was streaming on the members only. So sorry I'm a few minutes late. We was just talking about um he's talking about the money, man. We was talking about the money and and uh, yeah, man. So uh shout out to all the members that was over there. Uh so it's been a week. Last live stream was the um 
box trucking for dummies. And I told y'all someone was going to take it out of context. I told y'all someone's going to take it out of context. That's how you can tell people who, who read and people who don't read. And I even gave the disclaimer. I said, yo, this is a playoff, the dummy series. There's a whole series that's been out since before I was born. How to start this for dummy. How to cater for dummy. How to do this. And not only was it a, 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 a subscriber, it was a damn content creator. A content creator went on a whole tirade because they didn't watch the video. They looked at a thumbnail. And now all of a sudden I'm calling people dummies and exploiting my subscribers. You know, I, you can't make this stuff up. If people take the time to watch the content and comprehend, then, you know, that's how bullshit gets started. But I digress. I die grass all right so how was everybody's easter how was everybody how was everybody's easter man i hope everybody had a blessed peaceful easter um you know um my easter was really really good man went and spent time with my family got a chance to see my niece you know my mom you know cooking that heavy food that dressing you know shout out to all the old school moms and shout out to all the old school grandmamas who make they dressing from scratch. Shout out to, because the old school moms and the old school grandmas who really know how to cook, that down south cooking, that down south, whether you from down south or you migrated from the south, your moms and your grandmas migrated from the south during the great migration of the 50s up north. Those moms and those grandmas that really know how to cook, not that dressing from the box. What they call it? Jiffy mix? That stove top? We don't like that. And see, this is why it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. You know, if I ever decide that I'm going to tie that knot and, you know, you can't bring no stove top in my crib. Who got, who, listen, and your, your mama or your grandma. See, this is how you know your mama or your grandma can cook. One of them down south grandma. When they got the arm. And all this, the meat, the arm, meat, skin, got that, that arm that's sagging. How many of y'all got the grandma with the arm, the saggy arm with the, the arm, got all the meat and the sag? That's how you know she could cook. That's how you know she could cook. My grandma arm, the meat, God rest my grandma's soul, my mother's mother. She been dead since 94, but she had the, the granny arm. Y'all know what I'm talking about? See, some of y'all don't know about the granny arm. The arm with the, 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 it's just hanging. That's how you know, you see a grandma with an arm like that, you know she can cook. I'm not lying to you, man. That's why my mama can cook. But y'all, my mama made some, some dressing, some greens, all right? All from, see, from scratch now. A dressing is from scratch. Use the hot water. The hot water, hot water cornbread, you crumble it up. Yeah, ain't nothing out the box. The greens, potato salad from scratch, sweet potatoes. Yeah, it was a big old meal, man. It was a big old meal. Oh, no meat. I told her I want no meat. Cranberry sauce. It was good, man. So God bless all the moms out there that still know how to cook. And the grannies out there that still, <laughs> still know how to cook, man. So shout out to everybody. I hope everybody had a peaceful, great um Easter Sunday. All right, so boom. Come on in, make sure y'all hit that like button. Let's get let's get this show cracked. I'm gonna give y'all some gems today. I'm gonna give y'all some gems because I, I want y'all to think. So this is a playoff, the last live stream that we did this past Thursday on, you know, starting your box truck business and going about it. What I see a lot of people not doing is thinking outside the box. Right. A lot of people don't think outside the box. All right. So that's why I titled this live stream what I titled it, all right? I want to encourage people to start thinking outside of the box, all right? So finding a void. A lot of the times, the reason why you may not see success is because you're trying to duplicate what you see everybody else doing. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because, you know, this industry is competition. There's going to be some people that come in that get it. There's going to be some people that come in that don't get it. There's going to be some people that come in and they get it and other people get it. But this person is a little bit more aggressive than the next person. And they're going to take 
what that person has because they're willing to work harder. They're willing to stay out longer. They're more aggressive. They may have resources as far as capital than the other person, whatever the situation is. But there are other ways where you can see success that a lot of people bypass, and that's just finding a void. Find a void, get money, run up your bag, and reinvest it. Well, Mark, what do you mean finding a void? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you from experience, all right? And then you can take it, and I'm going to give you a few scenarios that I know a lot of people haven't thought about. I think one or two of these I've mentioned before, but I'm going to re-mention them again, and I'm going to give you a new one, all right? I'm going to give you a new one. And this new one is actually the season for this is coming up. Pay attention. Finding a void. So when I was first getting started with the moving business, right? Because I started the moving business before I started the, the trucking business, right? And I was coming into the business, and I was obviously doing it from a gig under the table perspective at first, right? And I, I noticed early on that the people that were calling me were a specific niche type of clientele, right? This wasn't the clientele that would call two men in a truck or Mayflower or Atlas or Wheaton or none of the private local big companies that had 50 trucks, right? These were people from a certain economic classification status. A lot of yuppies, right? If a person doesn't know what a yuppie is, it's a young urban professional, all right? A lot of, you know, fresh out of college, you know, graduates who have their first apartment and they have a lot of hand-me-down furniture. The parents give them their old furniture because now this is a reason for the parents to go out and buy new furniture. So they give their fresh, you know, law graduate moving into their first apartment, all their own furniture to get them started, right? Hand-me-down furniture, studios, you know, people who are looking for an economical move, right? So I started to do research because I said, why am I only getting specific? Why aren't people calling me that have the big houses in the suburbs in, in Northbrook or Highland Park or Crystal Lake or Schaumburg or uh, Burr Ridge or, you know, Aurora or wherever? Barrington, South Barrington, wherever. I'm getting the specific clientele, right? North side of Chicago, downtown Chicago, you know, West Loop, Bucktown, Wicker Park. It's all like yuppies who, you know, want a quick move. They want to get it done within the two hour minimum. They're on a budget. So by me receiving these customers, I, I, I research why, right? First thing I did was I researched my competition. And the first thing I researched was the prices. I was a lot cheaper. I was a lot cheaper, so that specific demographic that was coming to me could afford my prices. And then what I also realized is that there weren't any companies that catered specifically for smaller jobs, for smaller moves, and had a price point that reflected the size of the job, right? What I didn't understand at that point was why? Obviously, because of the cost associated with running a licensed moving company because I wasn't licensed at that point yet. So that was the niche. Focus on things less than a two-bedroom, primarily studios in one bedroom, at an affordable price and make my money in volume. Now I can do three moves per truck per day and make money because they don't have to pay. So my typical three uh, one bedroom move would cost a person less than $300 back then. Whereas if they called a larger private company or one of the big boys, they were still looking at seven or $800. So I was able to get in all of those moves to the point where I didn't have to do any advertising because the word of mouth started to spread. When we started to hit those dorm rooms, what I didn't realize is that parents had forums for University of Chicago or University of Illinois 
at Chicago and Loyola. The parents would be in forums and create forums and they would list vendors, right? Because a lot of these parents, you know, that send their kids to the University of Chicago, which is big. It's one of, you know, most popular medical, you know, colleges in the country or they send them here to Loyola. These parents aren't here. So they created a vendor list of trusted vendors that, you know, we trust these people around our children so that we don't have to fly from Michigan or Alabama or California to stand here to make sure that moving crew doesn't come in and, you know, assault SA. I don't want to say it because I want to stay in the algorithm. S A, or we'll just say Diddy, my daughter. Obviously, you know, Mrs. You know, Miller said she used, she wrote a great review and she posted it on the University of uh, Chicago's parent vendor list forum. Hey, use this company. They moved my daughter. They were great. You know, they weren't creepy. And we were the only moving company in these forums. This was the void. I found a void and I began to fill it. Smaller jobs at economical prices. And that was the secret to my early success. Now, as time goes on, obviously, you know, what hasn't been discovered will eventually get discovered and then someone will see your success and then they will duplicate it and so on and so forth. So as time goes on, it gets harder to try to find things that haven't been done. That's why it's always important to be an early adopter. But there's voids out here that aren't being fulfilled. I see them. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and give them all away. You still have to do your due diligence as a business owner because Marky Mark is not always going to be here. I was doing the members only live stream a few minutes ago um, on the members only side. We we're talking about stocks and cryptocurrency and, and and cool stuff like real world assets and AI narratives and stuff like that. So shout out to the members. And Costas was like, man, Mark has been a minute. I was kind of, well, he said something, he was getting Mark something because he I haven't did a live stream in about six days. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes I gotta go missing. I see the DMs and stuff. But I want to give you the information so that you can go out here and seek some of these answers for yourself because one day I'm going to disappear and be gone. It's just not the time right now, right? You see what I'm saying? So you have to find a void. Finding a void is going to make a life a lot easier for you in business, all right? Now, I know there's different sectors, all right? So let's talk about a few ideas, all right? Now, when you find these voids, you run your bag up and then you reinvest. This is how your business grows. All right, so let's talk about it. I've given this example before. It's April. I always say your brain as a business owner, you should be thinking six months ahead. So six months is going to put us at what? May, June, July, August, September, October. Mentally in my head, I'm celebrating damn near ready to celebrate Halloween. And I don't even celebrate Halloween. I'm a Christian. I think Halloween is the devil's day. But in my head, Halloween is coming up. Why? Because I'm six months ahead. Mentally, I've already been through the summertime. In my members only live stream, we were talking about exit strategies for later on this year. We don't talk about it when the time comes. We talk about it early on. Why? Because we never want to get caught left holding the bag. And this is something else that a lot of people got to understand, too. And it's starting to play out. I hate when people say, man, you know, they tell you stuff. And listen, nothing lasts forever. When I first started YouTube, you know how much flack I used to get? Well, man, Mark, Mark. <laughs> obviously, you don't know what you're talking about because why would you be leaving the box truck business? Something must be going wrong with you. Why? Because we were in a euphoric phase and I was talking to a lot of people who obviously hadn't been in this business, the subscribers, and then a lot of the flack and the little sneak stuff I would get for some of these other content creators, right, that were new into the business, were making money, and they didn't see what I saw. So everything I was saying then has obviously played out, and I was right. Nothing lasts forever. You have to have an extra strategy. 
You have to take profits along the way. Nothing lasts forever. Let's talk about it. For example, look what's going on in California. Look how many of these McDonald's owner operators, these Burger King franchise owners, Taco Bell, you name it, have been forced to go out of business this week. Because of something that I mentioned a few months ago, and it went over everybody's head, but April 1st came. And Gavin Newsom and the law got passed in effective April 1st, which was two days ago. If you work in the fast food industry in the state of California, minimum wage $20, mandatory. So one of two things is going to happen, right? In order to pay that payroll at that price point now, obviously the food is going to have to go up or the owners are going to have to go out of business, right? Because in most cases, a lot of consumers aren't going to pay $20 for a Happy Meal. Look how many McDonald's closed in California this past money. Look how many other fast food. Pizza Hut laid off all their delivery drivers. And announced a bunch of closures. Now, Here's a person 20 years ago, one lady owned 21 McDonald's, and I think she said she closed four automatically Monday. So look at it like this. Here is a situation where you have people that own franchises, right? And to own a McDonald's, you got to already have a million dollars. You got to have a million dollars liquid. And you have to have a million dollars in assets, right? Here's a person that, okay, I'm with the number one food chain. You know, obviously you got 21 McDonald's. You've been a McDonald's operator for some years now. This lady, I believe at one point in her head, she never thought that April 1st, what happened April 1st would ever come. But it came. You feel like you got a McDonald's, you're good. As long as you operate it right, you're good. But something happened that a lot of people that own fast food restaurants out there could have never saw it coming. Now, where are all these people going to go? They're not going to go work for anyone else. They're going to fall right into the gig economy and right into the self-employed business owner. So this is going to increase competition for you. It's going to increase competition for ride shares. It's going to increase competition for DoorDash, you know, Uber Eats, uh, 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 Grubhub, so on and so forth. Nothing lasts forever. So you always have to have an exit strategy. You always have to put money to the side and take profits along the way and reinvest back into your business so that you can get more out of your business so that, you know, when you do exit, you have capital to reinvest into other things so that you can keep growing and keep thriving. So, boom, mentally it's October. So what am I thinking about? I talked about a, 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 a play last year, pumpkins. Pumpkins have to get moved. This is not a play that happens all year long. This is a short-term money grab. But this is something that needs to be worked on now. These are the relationships. These are the, the point of contacts that you need to be making to run pumpkins. You need to be doing that now. Not in October, not in September. You need to be doing it now. And it exists. Another play that I talked about in the past, Christmas trees. Christmas trees got to get moved. When we did Christmas tree deliveries, they would deliver all my Christmas trees on a truck. Not a reefer truck, doesn't need a reefer, a regular van, truck, semi-truck, it would get delivered. Now, obviously, if it's a market that doesn't require seven, eight hundred trees like my market did when I was doing that contract, obviously half the semi-truck was for me. But if going to a smaller market, box truck. 
Now is the time to start making contacts with tree farms. You don't wait till October or November. Other people aren't thinking about these. These angles. These are relationships that you create. And every year during this time, you focus on those angles. And you get money. You don't, you have to think outside of the box. There's plenty of things you can do. But why aren't you thinking of the specific short-term niches like pumpkins and Christmas trees? They pay exceptionally well. Now there's one, like I said, I wasn't going to hold y'all long. That I'm really finna mess a lot of y'all up on. That I know y'all don't know about. I know about it because I'm in a big market. And I've gotten a chance to do some of the work. And I didn't seek it. It came to me and it wasn't. I, I, I'll tell you what I did. Uh, and I'll tell you how I stumbled upon. You know. Uh, this opportunity. If you have a box truck. But this is something that you need to be working on. And I'm going to give it to you. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to give it to you. Because I'm curious to see who's going to take this information and go out and apply it. And this may not work for everybody. All right. Um, I have to always get that disclaimer. Mark, you're in a big market. So, you know, some people who are in a big market, this may work out for. Some people who ain't, they may, if, you know, they search this opportunity and they're able to get it, they may have to, you know, go to a market for a, 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 a certain amount of time if they're granted or blessed with an opportunity like this. Festivals. Well, Mark, what does a box truck have to do with a festival? I'm going to tell you what it has to do. All right, so back in the day, around 2015, maybe 2016, <clears throat> At my peak, you know, I, I'm not turning nothing down. I got 13, 14, 15 trucks running, whatever. Opportunity come. If I need to go rent an extra truck, I'm calling Julie at Enterprise. Hey, Julie, I need another truck. I need it for a week. I got an opportunity. You know, and, you know, back then, you know, it wasn't no big deal. If you needed a truck, they had trucks on standby. You didn't have to make a reservation. You could just call short notice on demand. Mark sent somebody to pick it up, whatever. Boom. I called Julie. I said, Julie, I need a truck. She said, Mark, we ain't got no trucks. I'm like, what you, you ain't got no trucks? She said, no. Nah. She said, you know, every time around this year, Lala Palooza is in town and they get 25 trucks. We have to have 25 trucks for them every single year. I said, 25, 26 footers? She said, yeah, we have to make sure that we have enough trucks for them because we got a contract with them that every year when they come to town for Lala Palooza for those four days, we got to have 25 trucks for them for the week. I'm like, well, what are they doing with rental trucks? Right? Because I don't know that, 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 that end of the business. But me being inquisitive and in 25 trucks, I made it my business to find out. Why would Lollapalooza and festivals rent trucks? One, they're in the summer, right? So most moving companies, this is their busy time of the year. It's a busy time of the year. So they don't have 20, 25 trucks to a lot or multiple different moving companies working together. Don't have the trucks to a lot. You know, other contractors, every, everybody's really moving in the summertime. Summertime is really, really good. So what happens is they'll rent the trucks from Enterprise, Penske, wherever they can get them from. And when that festival is in town, obviously they hire day laborers for the short period the festival's three days four days obviously setup takes about a week or two um and then tear down right so what happens is they'll rent the trucks they'll hire staff for different jobs you know but then they'll have some of those staff members you know uh drive the trucks and then load and unload equipment right so they rent the trucks on their own and they just hire the day laborers to do all the loading and the unloading. But there is, you know, you do see 
some companies there. It's just a minimal amount. Majority of it, they end up having to hire people and rent trucks and do it themselves. Great opportunity to make a shit ton of money. Now, I ended up getting in with, you know, not that year when I first started doing the research. The following year, I got a call, you know. Hey, we ran across your company. We were wondering, you know, we're, we're going to be in town for Lollapalooza. We're doing a, 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 a marketing campaign and part of the marketing campaign, we're giving out bottles of water. I was wondering if you had a couple 26 footers that, you know, you can pick up. We're going to have the water shipped to this terminal it was an Estes terminal. And we need you to go there every day. And with these trucks and you pick up the full truckload pallets of water and bring it down to Lollapalooza. And we're going to give water away as part of our marketing campaign and get people to sign up for whatever it is they were marketing. They were giving bottles of water away. And then they had their company name and logo on the bottle. You think I turned it down? No, I gave them a price. And we got the contract. And when I tell you I gave them a price, I gave them a price. See, these special events, they pay really, 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 really well. And it's very minimal work. It's just literally going to the Astis Terminal, sending your trust to the Astis Terminal, picking up pallets of water. Yeah, it's a little work loading all the pallets. And unloading them at the, the park, you know, you know, you got to find somewhere. You got to double park. It's a festival. You got to get clearance and this, that, and the third. But you charge them for all this stuff. You charge them for the hassle when the trucks pull up to the gate and they got to get the security clearance. And then they got to wait for the dog to come and walk around the truck. And then they put the thing on the dog's nose and walk them around the truck and all that stuff. You, you charge them for that. And when I say you charge them, you charge them. And you know what? They pay it. You know why? Because they have a budget. And even what you charge them is going to be far less than what they have budgeted for. So they still come out ahead. The money that you can make off plays like that, you might, you might take you a month, month and a half to make. But these opportunities, you, you hear them from me because I'm experienced. I've done it before. I've had these opportunities. So I'm telling them to you. Now, this opportunity fell in my lap. You know, by this time, I was six, seven years in. Company name out there. But I'm giving you this information so that you can go look for these opportunities. There's plenty of festivals. Made in America Festival in Philadelphia. Coachella out in California, Lollapalooza in Chicago, Essence Festival down in where they do it at, New Orleans or wherever. I think Atlanta has multi-festivals throughout the summer. And then not only just the big festivals, you have other little festivals in neighborhoods throughout the summer. Find out who the proprietors are. The stage equipment is usually stored. They don't have trucks. Everything is outsourced per event. But what makes it easier for these proprietors is when they have vendors that they have a relationship with that they can work on a consistent basis. See, y'all just thinking about low bores and shit like that, which is fine. But a lot of y'all want to go over the road. So when... You have different opportunities that are right under your nose that you don't know about that you can make a lot of money from. These are the opportunities that you want to take advantage of. You got a lift gate, stage equipment. There's festivals every weekend in a lot of these major cities. Why aren't y'all moving stage equipment, sound equipment as a vendor? So when you say, oh, there's no money out there. And I, I always say, how come it's not? If you constantly look in the places where everyone else is looking. Of 
course it's going to be harder for you. That's why you have to think outside the box. And when I tell you these people, these proprietors are always looking for people. They're always looking for people. You know why? Because they still call me. I got an email today. They're always looking for people. They always need vendors to move sound and stage equipment and set up to before they can set up. It's just pick up and drop off. Realty companies always looking for truckers with a lift gate. to move staging furniture from storage to facility, back from facility to storage. Interior design companies always looking for people to pick up from storage to facility, from facility back to storage. Why? Because they don't own trucks. They hire vendors. There's plenty of voids that a lot of people don't know about, and this is why they're not filled. A great business person, a great entrepreneur looks for voids. This is how you make money. This is how you get rich. And it doesn't just have to be in trucking. There's a play right now that I'm looking into that after the build out and the initial cost, it doesn't really even require a human being for maintenance. And I'll give you a hint. It's an online business fully driven by AI technology. And it's not a technical business. It's something very, very simple. I constantly look for voids and anything, right? Because eventually people are going to find this stuff out. And then once people find it out and more people get into it and people start running their mouth, telling them how much money they make, that market becomes saturated and then you got to move on to something else. And obviously, the people who were in these different niches first become, you know, the big dogs or the grandfathers or, you know, the big players in that niche. But they see their profit margins slowly start to dwindle down because now you have more players into the market. And it's like I always tell you, more competition, you got to lower your rates. See, when you're the only player in the market, you can set your rates at whatever you want to set your rates at because there's not much for a consumer to choose from. If they need this service or they need this product and there's nobody else, then they got to come to you. You have to find a void. Now, you don't have to. You can continue to do what you want, but this is just another thing that I want you to think about when you're sitting, you're meditating at night or in the morning on how you're going to grow your business. It's definitely tougher now. It's a lot tougher than it was when I started. And it's only going to get tougher. As time goes on, things are getting tougher. It goes back to the restaurant industry, like I was talking about earlier in the live stream out in California, how they're up in the minimum wage, but they're not doing it on a state level. They're doing it by sector. This is something we never saw before. They're doing it by sector. But doing that is going to affect the other, other sectors 
uh damn near directly why because here's the thing a person goes to school to become a nurse an rn and they spend all this money and on 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 um you know uh college tuition only to get out and make a few dollars more than a little man man flipping fries so am I gonna go spend a hundred thousand dollars to become a BS BSR BSN RN? No. And then the trickle down effect is gonna go from state to state to state. That's gonna make different sectors harder. And they're gonna do this in multitude of sectors. It's a reason why they start in the fast food sector. Prices are going to go up. Prices are going to go up and there's going to be more competition flooding into your industries. And the, and the industries that were, you know, felt like that they were here because fast food and delivery drivers were down here. Now you're at the same level. Things are only going to get harder. We we can talk about migrants, but I think we talked enough about that. A lot of the jobs that person down here complaining about that Gavin Newsom upped the minimum wage here. See, here, here's the thing. Upping the minimum wage doesn't really do anything. Why? Because now everything is going to come up with it. If we got to pay more, that means our products have to come up. So really, it's the, you're not gaining nothing. You're not you're not really gaining anything. But because of that, it's going to start affecting a lot of industries because there's more people that's going to be pouring into your shit, and that's going to be more competition that you're going to have to deal with. And guess what? They're going to come in and they're going to go to YouTube. They're going to go to Google. They're going to go to Instagram. Shout out to that person who left that, that, that super chat. I appreciate you reading in a second. And they're going to be looking to do the same thing that you're doing. The basic stuff. Because they're not going to think outside of the box either. Because they haven't stumbled across Marky Mark's channel. You want to think like the few you don't want to think like the many you want to think like the few you don't want to think like the many who left the super chat where is it at uh here it is preach increase my cargo insurance to 250k so i can haul gaming machines to casinos there's a lot of money locally thanks mark man listen listen see what i'm saying see what i'm saying <laughs> Thinking outside the box. So he's hauling gaming machines to casinos. He's dealing with he's dealing with casinos. So he's making a bag. I don't have to ask him what he's charging them, what they're paying him. I know he's making a bag. He's dealing with slot machines and casinos. That's money. Slot machines, money, casinos, money. That whole conversation ain't nothing but money. Thinking outside the box. Everything ain't low boards. Everything ain't three PLs. There's other opportunities out here. And I know plenty more of them. But I'm not, I can't sit here and spoon feed you guys. Because in order for you to be a successful business owner, you're going to have to sit down, research, Think of things, make phone calls, create relationships, drive to places and inquire. You're going to have to do some of this legwork yourself. I'm just here to jog your mind state so that you can understand, wow, I didn't think of that. Wow, so you mean to tell me these things exist? So you mean to tell me the only thing 
that you know the only there that I can play is a low board. That it's, it's other things than low boards and three PLs. Yes, yes. I've had projects. I've had one week projects, two week projects, one month projects. And when you get a project, these projects pay exceptionally well. I've had projects for celebrities. There's plenty of opportunity out here. And when you find a void, you get the money, and then after you get the money, here's the key thing, here's the key thing, reinvest it back into yourself. Reinvest it back into your business. Because your window, you have a window. Everybody has a window. Nothing lasts forever, man, nothing. And, you know, I was ignorant to the fact, too, when I first came into the business, I was literally thinking, like, this is... I'm going to pass this trucking business. We're making so much money with this Ikea. I can't believe they're paying me this much money to do this. I could not believe they were giving me $500 a route, $600 a route on the weekend back then. And some of you are making that money now. This is why I'm telling you everything has gone up, but the rates are the same. We were getting $600 a day back in 2013 for a route. And then on some of these days, we would only get one stop. I got three trucks running Ikea. Morning route and then five to nines. And each route is getting $500 money through Friday, $600 a route Saturday and Sunday. And some of those days on those slower days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it will be one stop per truck. It'll be three stops total. They'll divide it amongst the three trucks. One stop per truck. And they still have to pay me my guarantee. Obviously, Sundays would be busy and Mondays would be, be busy. Why? Because Saturdays and Sundays were the weekend. That's when people go shop and a person goes to Ikea on a Saturday. They pay and then they request next day delivery, which is Sunday. That's why deliveries were busy on Sundays. Person going to Ikea on Sunday, they request next day delivery. That's why deliveries were busy on Monday. Sundays and Mondays were the two busiest days for deliveries for Ikea. The rest of the days were slow. For the most part, unless... The, the, the early morning deliveries were busy because the morning deliveries were just kitchens, pretty much full kitchens. But those five to nines, maybe one stop. Still get the guarantee. All that money from that blessing, because it was a blessing. Why? Because that doesn't happen. There's no way a company today is going to give you a guarantee for one. And if it's only one stop, no, they're not going to give it. They're going to find another route to put that on. They're going to call that customer and tell them, make up some lie and push that stop back to another day when they can add it to a route that's a little bit fuller. They're not doing that now. That was one of the ways that I was able to scale my company aggressively in 2013 and 2014. Because a lot of that overflow of money that I had, that margin, which was huge, I continued to reinvest it back into the company and grow the company. Why? Window. Then guess what? They lost the contract. So what I was thinking that was going to last forever, it abruptly stopped. Not because of my doing but because the company wasn't performing on a national scale that they promised the retailer they would. So the retailer went and sourced another company that sold them a dream that they could do a better job, which we went and got with that company. But you get the point. Nothing lasts forever. You have to keep this in mind as a business owner. We're looking at McDonald's closing. We're looking at huge franchises closing. Why? Because things change. People change. Technology forces change. Guess what? If Gavin Newsom didn't raise the minimum wage <coughs> to force a lot of these entrepreneurs in California to close, 
<coughs> AI technology was going to force a lot of these employees on the street anyway. Look into a company called Flippy. Is Flippy publicly at? Is Flippy publicly traded yet? Is Flippy publicly traded yet? Because it, when it becomes public, I need to invest in Flippy. Is Flippy public yet? No, I don't think it's public yet. Nope. It's not public. But Flippy is AI technology that's going to cook your burger in the kitchen and toss your fries around. All right? We don't need a human to do that no more. Right? So an individual who wants to complain about not making money and minimum wage, no problem. Flippy is going to replace you. Flippy is going to replace you. So whether the minimum wage for fast food is $20 or whether it's still $9, it doesn't matter because Flippy is going to replace you anyway. Nothing lasts forever. Now to the owner operator, we can get rid of a bunch of labor, but to the employee, So for the fast food restaurants that are left, it doesn't matter anyway. They're just going to get robotics powered by AI technology. They're going to hire one or two people to take driving orders and one to sweep up and load the machines. And that's it. Nothing lasts forever. No one saw COVID coming. Look how many businesses were destroyed by COVID. Look how many businesses are being destroyed, destroyed by technology, specifically AI technology. I got an idea for an online business fully powered by AI technology. I'm not going to talk about it right here. I don't know who's watching. I just found, you know, I got celebrity, you know, followers and not, you know, I got other people that I didn't know was following me that got a big, way bigger bag than me. So I can't give my ideas away. Nothing lasts forever. So if you're in a business now, and I'm not the one to tell a person, oh, well, this may not be something that you're going to have for 20, 30 years, and you'll be able to pass it down to a little man, man. You know, it's a possibility that technology be, will, will be so far advanced that even if you do remain in a specific sector, Technology has already removed you way before little man man became of age to run the business if you was going to hand it down to him anyway. This is something that you got to keep in the back of your mind as well. I've said it before, never in a million years, if you would have told me 10 years ago, we would be a point, we would be at a point where people did not want to work. I would have never believed you. I would have bet you. We could have, you could have bet me anything I had. I would have put it up. I would have never believed it. Why? Because I remember saying back in the day, well, I'm going to keep buying trucks. Because as long as I got trucks, I'm going to keep making money. I said this. I said, man, as long as I keep getting trucks, as long as I got trucks, I'm going to keep making money. Because there's always going to be somebody that needs to work. I said this. Never in a million years, if you would have told me 10 years ago, yo, Mark, in 10 years, it's going to be an event that's going to come and it's going to change the mindset of the way people look at work. I wouldn't have believed you. Because I would have I would have started to, to argue, well, man, well, the economy needs to, well, man, things need to get done. How is the world going to continue to move forward if people don't want to work? The economy has to move forward people have to come to work in order for things to happen who's going to do this who's going to do it who's going to do this who's going to do that i would have never believed it but yet and still it happened so it may not be something that you did it may be something that happened around you That's forcing you and other people out of your industry. It could be technology driven. It could be a a a a a, a catastrophic event, a world event 
similar to what we saw with the pandemic. So when you find this void and you get money, because if you find a void, you're going to get money. You're going to get money. There's no doubt about it. If you find a void in your sector, you're going to run up a bag. No, no if, ands, or maybes. You're going to make money. But you got to reinvest it back into the business so that you can continue to make money because time is ticking. Your business is like a life. And as time goes on and as technology advances, that business life cycle, it gets shorter and shorter. We were in, once in a time where technology didn't move as fast as it's, as it's moving. Now, technology is moving fast now. As technology advances, it moves faster. That's why you can see a, 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 a industry come and go in a matter of 10 years. Or you can see a technological advancement from 10 years ago come and go. See, back in the day, technology didn't move as fast as it is. That's why you had a lot of these old guys sitting on a lot of these board of directors who thought that that money was going to keep coming because technology wasn't moving that fast. You want to talk about some of them? Look at Toys R Us. Look how many years they sat on top of the throne. KB Toy Stores never came close to Toys R Us. But in 1991, the World Wide Web was created. And they said in 15, 20 years, the way people shop is going to be different. But you had companies like Toys R Us, Montgomery Ward, Sears, Borders Bookstore, Zare, Ames, Venture, and the list goes on. Like, I can sit here and name a bunch of big box retailers that had been sitting on the throne for years just getting money. If you go back and you look at some of the interviews, you would see some of these founders and these people who sat on the board of directors say, oh, that'll never happen. No, people, the way people buy, you know, the traditional way of people buying, it's going to always be here. A person wants to come into the store and they want to lay on the mattress and they want to roll and they want to feel how soft it is. No one wants to buy a mattress on this worldwide whatever it is web thing and and how are they going to deliver it so you mean to tell me someone's going to buy a mattress that they never got a chance to sit and feel how comfortable it is on this worldwide web thing and have it delivered who's going to deliver a mattress so guess what they didn't allot money into r&d mark what's r&d research and development they were naive. But sure enough, technology came and it got better and better and better and better. And as it got better, you had new players into the game that took the torch from the previous people that got it to where it was and made it better. Elon Musk with PayPal. Now we got payment structure. Jeff Bezos, 1995, 96, Amazon. Oh, bye-bye borders. Oh, PayPal, let's buy eBay. You got a tech bubble going on in the late 90s, early into the 2000s. Walmart expanded because they did R&D. They didn't do it to the point where they understood the internet. But they did it to the point 
where they understood supply and demand and low cost structure. And logistics. Bye bye Montgomery Ward. Bye bye Sears. Bye bye Venture. Bye bye Zare. Bye bye Ames. Bye bye Woolworth. I'm going to jump into another sector, Napster, LimeWire, because some of y'all ain't old enough. Some of y'all ain't old enough to remember Napster. Bye-bye, FYE. Bye-bye, Coconuts. Bye bye Music Land. Bye bye Tower Records. Bye bye Virgin Records. Do I need to keep going? Nothing lasts forever. Trucking is one of those things that. Yeah, it does require a human, but for how long? That's something that can be left up for debate. But there's another component to that we can add into this conversation, which is what I alluded to a few minutes ago, which is the mindset of the way people look at work. There's a lot more players in the game now because this is an opportunity for a person to work for themselves. So if it's not technology, it's a lot more competition. And competition is going to lower prices, as I've educated people on. When I tell people to stop saying that, stop taking cheap freight line. It lowers prices. And if you don't know how to run your business effectively, understanding this, it also drives people out of the sector altogether. So when I say reinvest, I'm talking about it in initial initially. Long as the time where you see the business owner with the successful business or the successful storefront with their Cadillac parked in front of their record store. That was once a time if you owned a barber shop, you was getting money. Man, don't nobody go to the barber shop no more. Every barber I know got two, three jobs. Every hairdresser I know got a couple different jobs. You can't make money just cutting hair and doing hair no more. The person who owned the neighborhood music shop, they was getting a bag. Why? Because records existed. Tapes existed. CDs existed. That stuff don't exist no more. Technology put them out. But back then, though, that was the only way you could buy music. And these individuals were making a lot of money. And at one point, they would have never thought. There's somebody in 1985 that owned a record store in your community that would, if you would have told them about, if you could go into the future and tell them about Bluetooth and MP3 players and iPods, which don't exist no more, but when uh, Steve Jobs created the iPod and how this is going to replace music and music was going to be streamed to your device, you could stream it to your phone. And all this, they wouldn't have believed you. Because I wouldn't have believed the individual who time traveled into 2022 or 2021 or 2020 or 2023 or 2024 back in 2013 and told me, yo, I just came from 2023. Listen, bro, by 2022, you need to have a plan for exit by 2022 because people ain't going to want to work no more. Man, man and them, they lifting for you now, but man, man and them ain't finna lift for you in 2023. I'm gonna be like, well, man, they felons. Who else gonna give them out? Listen, I'm telling you, it's some shit. I just saw some shit called DoorDash. It's some other stuff out there they doing called Roadie and they get the girl to sign up, but then they deliver the food. 
but they get the money because the girlfriend, so even though they're a felon, they won't let them sign up. They had a girl sign up and then they go deliver the food. So the same money that you paying them with the cost of inflation, 10 years down the line, what you would be paying, they're going to be making that money doing less work. Set you an exit plan. I wouldn't have believed it. So you mean to tell me you came from 2023 and this is what, listen, and also people wasn't working. The McDonald's on 95th and Ash, uh, 95th and, 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 and State Street is closed, it's boarded up. Wait a minute, that McDonald's be popping. Man, listen, a bunch of restaurants, wasn't no more malls. The malls is gone? What, listen, Forest, uh, uh, Evergreen, gone. River Oaks is dead. Wait a minute, hold on. I wouldn't have believed it. I swear for God, I would not have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it. So when I say reinvest, reinvest. When you see yourself making money, that's not like we're not in a time period where when you do see some hope, a little light, man, OK, I got it. Things are starting to, to, to pan out. We're profitable. Now ain't the time to go out. You, you ain't, It ain't S580 time. That ain't time. You can't buy S580 from your active source of income anymore. Those days are long gone for the most part, depending on your industry. Depending on your industry, you're running a box truck. You're not, you're not making S580 money. A lot of industries where you could create a small business and make money hand over fist, those years are gone. You could own a record store in the neighborhood and make S whatever S500 money back in the day. Why? Because that was how you got music. In the 80s, oh, you made a killer. Michael Jackson come out with Thriller, 1982, 1983. You got a record store in the hood. You selling Michael Jackson albums back to back. However many the distributor can send you, you can sell out the whole, the, whatever the distributor said, you can sell out within a day. Because this was the way you bought music and you were able to get rid of volume. Technology wasn't advanced. It wasn't moving that fast. Your community supported you. There was no such thing as online where you could get it cheaper. Person went to what was nearest to them. That's why if you can remember, if you're old enough to remember, communities looked a lot different back in the day than they look now. Business stayed around a lot longer. Because if you could actually duplicate something back then, but not, not necessarily, the void was seeing an area that didn't have something and putting it there. Okay, this area doesn't have a grocery store. If I put a grocery store in this area, it's going to make money because the residents from this zip code don't have to travel to the next zip code to get their, their fruits and vegetables no more. If I put a record store in this zip code, they don't have to travel. It was just as simple as that back in the day, but now it's a little bit more difficult. So it's, it's, it's important that you reinvest the money back into your business, scale your business, make your business as profitable as can, and then take that money and invest into other things that are going to make you other forms of income, right? You want to have multi streams of income. You have to do that now. You didn't have to do that back in the day. Why? Because your time is ticking. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Time is ticking. There's some things that I know that I'm not going to talk about. I don't think people are ready for that yet. I don't want to, I want people to go out and do what they need to do. I don't want to put, you know, five and six and eight year
things that could possibly change the sector and get you to think about that stuff. No, go ahead and get your money. But keep in the back of your mind that you're on a time frame. So all your money should be going back into your business so that you can make more money and then pouring that thing, that money into other things that are going to also make you money. And the easiest way to do that is to find a void. Start looking for voids. I gave you a few of them. All right. I gave you a few, maybe, you know, in a few live streams or a couple more weeks, I may drop a few more voids. Somebody gave one in the chat. Super chat. There was another super chat. Let me read it. I'm sorry. I'm not. The truck doesn't care how much, how the truck doesn't care how you make your money. I also do junk remove on the side, pay $400 for a lead on Thumbtack, may bank on that metal. So if he paid $400 for a lead on Thumbtack, just imagine how much he charged. I gave people the thumbtack play. I told people how to get money on thumbtack. Listen, man, the ball is in your court. Listen, you got a truck. You should be making money. If you're relying on the traditional way that you think you're supposed to make money, then that's on you because you're not thinking outside the box. You're going to be an entrepreneur, just like I talk about on these call-in shows. You got to think, you, you you made the choice to be a business owner. So you don't have anybody thinking for you. You got a job, you just report to your job and your supervisor tells you what to do. They doing all the thinking for you. They doing all the thinking for you. But when you start your own business, you got to think for yourself. You are the head thinker in charge. And if you're just going to come in playing the low board and the 3PL game and think that's how you're going to effectively run your company throughout the whole tenure of your business, you know, cool. But you still need to be thinking outside the box because a person who's thinking outside the box is a person who's trying to get more, trying to get ahead a lot quicker, a lot faster with doing minimal. I want to make money, more money with doing less work. If there's a play that I can make the same amount of money for a project, a day or two project that I would, I would have to go out on the road for a week for, then that's what I want to do. If I know the summertime, I'm in a market where the summertime is going to bring a lot of opportunities for me being a vendor as a, as a, as a owner of a trucking company with lift gates and I could be a vendor for festivals, then you know what? My trucks can focus on festivals. And forget just the festival. What about all the, the, the vendors within the festival? The, the restaurant vendors, the food vendors. Those are also other relationships that you need to be making. Yo, I need this bra. Man, can you run this for me? Man, we need all our equipment dropped off two days prior to the event started, and then we need you to pick it up. The, the last day of the event is Sunday. It ends at 11. We have to have our section clear by 6 a.m. to the following morning. How much are you going to charge us to load up overnight and run our stuff back to wherever it needs to come from? All right, well, we do this. We do, we do, we do this event. We got this coming up in two weeks. We got that coming up in two weeks. But we do this event every year. Can you give me a, 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 a price sheet or a quote for each event? What you think I charge these people for three 26-footers for four days of cases and pallets of water? For four days.
I thought I I remember I thought I was taxing the lady. Oh, she said, oh, that's great. I'm like, damn, I hate when they say that means I could have charged you more. And I already thought I was taxing her. These special events, their budgets are huge, huge. Start thinking outside the box, man. All right, man, we're going to take a few questions and we're going to get out of here. Uh, let's see. Five Star say he missed Napster. I miss Napster too. You know, I got a lot of, I remember getting a lot of viruses from Napster and LimeWire back in the day too. I, I messed up a lot of computers dealing with Napster and LimeWire back in the day. Uh, somebody said Blockbuster, Blockbuster gone. We all know what put Blockbuster out of business. On demand. What what's the big one? Netflix. Who remembers Na uh Blockbuster video and Holly Blockbuster and Hollywood video? Gone. Gone. What's up, Mark? Just got the job. 21 an hour start Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning making granite countertops. I'm gonna stack my money. Uh, BNT Transport will be successful. Thanks for what you do. Appreciate you, man. Congratulations on the job. Mark, Flippy is at White Castle. Yeah, I know Flippy is already out. It's already out. I'm waiting for him to go public. Flippy is on my list of companies that when they go public, I am investing them and I am adding Flippy to my portfolio. Listen, Flippy is going to put a lot of, it's going to, it's going to, this place a lot of people. A lot of people who are 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 long time fast food uh, uh, workers. You're gonna get you're gonna get displaced, all right. And I'm going to invest into Flippy because I think it's great technology, and I want to be a part financially of that success. I cannot wait until that company goes public. Shout out to Costas. Uh, let me see if I got any questions here. Let me scroll back down. I think I saw one. I love generic Woolworths. I could tell who, who the OGs around here. I could tell who the OGs around here. Uh, let me see. How long did it take for you to be booked out in advance when you were moving? A month? So now, so, okay, so this is the beginning of moving season. Right now we are in the first week, sec, first, second week of the busy moving season. So as the summer continues to go on, April, you should be booking out for May, all right? Your hot week for May is going to be the last week, all right? The first week and the last week. So the last week of April, first week of May, obviously around Memorial Day weekend, very, 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 very busy. Going into the 31st, going into the 1st of June, first week of June, uh, kind of cools off. Last week of June, going into 4th of July, very, very, very busy. These are the weeks that you're going to be making money hand over fist, and these are the weeks that are going to book out a month in advance. You should be booked out for your peak weeks a month or two months in advance. You should be taking bookings, and you should be filling up your calendar right now for the end of this month, beginning of next month, and for the end of next month. So a month, two months in advance. Uh, hey, Mark, up in Minneapolis, Uber and Lyft is going to shut down due to an ordinance that Uber and Lyft must pay. So I read about that. So they were pulling out because Minneapolis wanted them to pay their drivers more. They said, oh, we're not going to pay more. So they opted to pull out. But I think Minneapolis, from the last I read, Minneapolis pulled them back to the table to try to work something out. And, you know, this that that's something else. It just goes to tell you that, you know, listen, I don't care what these companies' mission statement is. 
they'll make it seem like they're for you and they're for the whatever the situation may be if it's uh doordash they're for the delivery guy if it's for a ride share they're for the driver slash the the passenger because they want to make you know ride sharing accessible because cabs wouldn't go in certain neighborhoods and pick people up but at the end of the day this is a testament to the bottom line and what what what's crazy is in uber and lyft out of all the years since 2009 they're still not profitable Uber is not profitable as far as the ride sharing. Uber Freight is prof profitable. Uber Eats is profitable. But the business that they started, you know, Uber Eats was a spawn from Uber. Uber Freight was a spawn from Uber to ride share. The business that they built, Uber ride sharing, is not profitable. You know why? Because now we can look at it years down the line when everyone thought this technology was great. It's really not that great. The technology is simple. But the margins aren't there for them. What they have to do to keep people on the platform to meet the demand that they created they cannot do it therefore they can't turn over a profit therefore they can't turn over a profit so out of what 14 years 15 years now still not profitable so they're not going to pay more. They're actually going to pay less. And since Minneapolis wants them to pay more, they say, you know what? We're just going to leave. Nothing lasts forever. Who would pay $20 for a Happy Meal? There's people out in the California paying that much right now. There's people out there paying that much right now. So guess what? Either they're going to pay it or they're not going to pay it. And if they don't pay it, then it's going to force the, the, franchise, the franchisees to close their doors. And we're already seeing a bunch of them closing their doors already. They closed their door the first day the law was passed, which was April 1st. Some of them said we're not even going to deal with it because we know we're not going to be able to operate paying this high of a payroll. So what I'm telling you is when you do certain things and you're on certain platforms, they lay out to you what it is. Now, when they make changes along the way, you have a choice. Either you're going to roll with the changes or you're not going to roll with the changes. At the end of the day, you have to understand that all these companies, all these third party companies, these 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 ride share the the food delivery apps the 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 the, 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 the delivery apps for for goods for merchandise your roadie your road ro your roadie your curie mothership go share listen their their primary objective is to be profitable i don't care what their mission statement says DCs. I don't care about none of that stuff, especially Uber and Lyft. Why? Because they're publicly traded. They have a responsibility to make profit for their investors. Anybody that buys that stock, they have an objective to be profitable. These are publicly traded companies. Their primary goal is to become profitable by any means necessary. So if they have to pay you less and charge the rider more to get to that goal, then that's what they're going to do. At the end of the day, it's business. Now, on the other end, 
the individuals that use these platforms, Rody, Curry, Uber, Lyft, uh, Mothership, whatever, you have a choice. And just because the dollar amount is this today doesn't mean it's going to be that tomorrow. What do most of these companies do? When they introduce a company, when there's a new company that comes onto a platform, a new tech company, right? Ride share, food delivery, uh, uh, goods delivery via Curry, Mothership, whatever. Their, 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 their first goals, are they already have VC money, all right? They, either, they got seed money from angel investors. They have VC money from venture capitalists. They already plan with a bag. They already expect to operate the first X amount of years in the red anyway. Why? Because what they want to do is they want to get the consumer accustomed to using the service. They want you to depend on it. Let's take, let's do a case study real quick before I get out of here. I love, see this, I love doing it. Uber and Lyft, when they started, they had VC money, a shit ton of VC money. Listen, we're 14 years in, 15 years in, they're still not profitable. And they got enough VC money to go another 10 years in the red. The first few years when these companies were coming to town, they wanted to get the consumer accustomed to using the service. So they offered low rates and then they paid the service providers, which were the drivers, big rates. Now, what has happened over time since 09, right? Because they started with black car services then they open it up to economy rise and then they have different tier economy rides you got your your x your you know your black car service your comfort whatever as time went on and it became more of a a a a a, a, a business that they saw that that was that was going to stick around they figured it out the taxi cab industry imploded they they're gone for the most part why because people switch from taking taxis traditional taxi cabs to the ride share why because they were offering those rides at a very 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 cheap price i remember when uber first came to town i was taking ubers for three and four dollars five dollars six dollars i remember going to the airport for 20 some 30 dollars now a trip to the airport is a hundred bucks So they took all that clientele from the ta the taxi cab industry, the, tap the taxi cab industry, pretty much slowly, most a lot of those companies went out of business. They paid the drivers a lot of money. Why? Because they needed to have enough service providers on the platform to meet the demand. So the, the consumer is happy. They're taking cheap rides. The drivers are happy. They're making three, four thousand dollars a week. All right, well, you know what? We got to start making some money. Slowly start going up on the passengers, the riders. Slowly start decreasing the percentage for the driver. But guess what? At this point, they already have the consumers accustomed to using the service. Taxi cabs aren't as prevalent as they used to be. They still out here but they're far and few between. So you can get a ride quicker, probably with ride share than trying to hail a cab. They have people custom to using it. So guess what? The consumers see the rates going up. They may complain, but guess what? They still use the service. Now on the flip side, The service provider has other options. They can go do something else. So in order to keep supply up with demand, these companies have to pay out promotional, give discounts, all type of stuff, offer incentives to get people on the platform to meet the demand. And all these bonuses and extra incentives and incentivizing people and uh referrals and all this stuff to get people on on to meet the demand is what's cutting into their profit margin so 
So I wouldn't say these companies are robbing you. They're doing what they have to do to be profitable. It's up to the, the provider if they want to continue to utilize that platform or not to make money. Same thing with your roadie, same thing with your go share, same thing with your mothership, same thing with your curry, same thing with your load board. Because even though the supply may not be, be meeting the demand, somebody's still out there doing it. Same thing with your load board. What you may think is a low rate, somebody's going to take that rate. And they, be may, they may be taking it ignorantly at a loss because they just don't know any better. They don't know their cost per mile. They may be taking it profitably because they have a low cost per mile. But that determines the market. Unfortunately for those companies, I don't think when they started the companies, because, you know, they ousted the founder about five or six years ago. I don't think that they thought it was going to play out the way it played out. I don't think they could foresee a pandemic. I don't think they could foresee a lot of things. But hey, that's business. You know, so it is what it is. Axel says he knows 100% Curry is robbing drivers. People can create their own ride sharing company if you have the capital and the backing to do so. Sure, why not? How can I find consistent work with my box truck? One man work. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I have some capital saved or working capital. I think now is a good time to get into one man. Um, we're in the season now for outside seasonal, you know, uh, freight. So, you know, your Lowe's and your Home Depot is, the, I think right now is the right opportunity. Um, I don't know if T-Force lost Home Depot in every market, but they did lose it in some markets. Um, AIT has it now. Um, so you might want to look into AIT and you might want to look into RXO for Lowe's. Uh... Kevin said, I thought they were a multi-billion dollar company. They are a multi-billion dollar company, but a lot of that money is, is VC money. They're making money in eats and freight. Why? Because in freight, they're just brokering. They're just doing third-party brokering, which they're doing on the ride share side. But on the ride share side, it's not like on the freight side, right? That barrier to entry, it means a lot. I was explaining this to someone earlier this week. Because they came from the semi truck business down to the box truck business. And I was talking to them and they thought that it would be a lot easier to hire a box truck driver and retain them than a semi truck driver. And I told them, no, it's the opposite. And then I had to explain to them why I talked about the barrier to entry. A CDL driver, I don't care how you look at it. That buried entry, that CDL, that endorsement makes that driver a more professional driver than a box truck driver. You could be a professional driver. You could follow the rules of the road. But there's nothing deeming you as a professional. That CDA class A or class B you're deemed as a professional driver. So those drivers, when you're hiring people, right, uh, they take things a little bit more serious, right? So when they're brokering freight on the Uber freight side, they're dealing with a shipper, they have a load on their load board. If a driver wants it, he accepts it. If he doesn't, he doesn't have to. The money is being invested into the technology. And the very few individuals 
that are coding the technology and doing the cybersecurity to make sure it doesn't get hacked. Point and click for the most part. Doesn't require that much. Uber Eats is just a platform. We have a platform that people know. You put your restaurant on our platform, your sales are going to go up. This is fact. But if you list on our platform, getting access to our millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of, 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 of database, consumer database, it's going to cost you 30% of whatever the total order is or whatever the people order on our platform to get delivered to you. So if their order is $30, we're going to take 30% of that. That's why when you go into some of the restaurants, you see the price is cheaper than what you see it on Uber Eats because a lot of restaurants got smart and they started to increase the prices to cover the loss, right, for what they have to pay the platform for being on the platform because, it was, you know, prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of restaurants that weren't on Eats, but they were forced to go onto these, right, these platforms during the pandemic, and then they did see that it did increase, right? It, 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 inc it increased their orders, right? But you have to un also understand that the restaurant margins are small, very, very small. So to supplement that, they just increased the rates to help cover the cost of what they're paying them. So they're charging a person 30% just for being on that platform. It doesn't really... If you, if you buy something from McDonald's, we're taking 30% of it. whoop de doo Now, on the ride share side, it's supply and demand. There's really no supply and demand narrative with Uber Eats. List your restaurant on our platform. You're going to make more money. Whatever you sell, we're taking 30%. It's simple. The technology is doing all the work. If we have created the demand in this market of Las Vegas because we put taxi cabs out of business and we got people accustomed to utilizing this infrastructure this platform we have to make sure that we have enough people to meet the demand and if it, it and if certain markets it, it causes us to have to spend money to increase the supply then that's what they have to do and spending money to to increase the uh, supply by incentivizing people to come on their platform it's what's cutting into their bottom line. So, yes, they have capital. But that capital is still VC money. It's not profit. It's not a, they're not a profitable company. Just because you look at the market cap. doesn't mean that money came for profit that's still vc angel investor money every quarter they do an earnings call and every quarter they're still operating in the red uh all right let me see Uh, 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 make sure I just want to see a few more questions. You said you had a guy yesterday tell you you couldn't pay off a truck early. I would have to wait two years, which I thought was crazy. So it sounds like if you bought, if this is you, it sounds like you might have bought your truck from a um, maybe a hard money lender or maybe a a a, 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 a one of those um, equipment financing places. If so, then yeah, there's probably a prepayment penalty. They make their money off the life of the term that that you sign you got to look at that paperwork thoroughly when you go with those non-traditional institutions to finance equipment uh because 
what what I've come to realize is they really don't do an interest rate. They really do a fixed uh, cost of what they want to make. So if you're borrowing 50, they may say, OK, well, we're going to charge you X amount of dollars a month, but you're going to pay back 90. And then when you do the math on that and you see the rate, it's it's really sky high because they charge you a fixed number. So if they say, all right, boom, we loaning you 50, but we want to make 40 off that 50. So you need to pay us back 90. You know, so they're not going to let you pay it off early. Because there's no principal there because it's not interest. They charge you a flat rate over the life of the pot of the term of the 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 loan. So. Yeah, you want to stay away from those those types of deals, man, those types of deals are are very, 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 very shady. And. um end up costing you more in the long run. That's such a crazy scam that it's legal. Yeah, it's 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 legal and it 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 puts a lot of people out of business. A lot of people come into business, they're excited, you know, they you know they don't understand what they're reading, what they're looking at. They sign it because they're excited. They just want to get things going they want to get their business started and then as time goes on as time goes on you know when you know it always takes some type of hardship to come or maybe you just don't see the money adding up to force people to go really look into their finances when in actuality people should be looking into these things um from the initiation of their business from the inception i should say of their business but they always people always do it when hardship comes and i think that's what you know just puts most a lot of people out of business uh uh guys i love talking about this stuff mark uber was a disruptor game changer innovation that these companies Brought change entire industries. Same with Amazon. Yeah. So yeah, Uber was definitely a disruptor. Um, you know, it, it put a lot of people out of business, which ties into what I talked about earlier, the taxi cab industry. Years and years and years and years and years, the taxi cab industry went unthreatened. Went unthreatened and then rideshare comes along. And a lot of these guys were displaced. A lot of them had to fold into ride sharing, which you see a lot of those guys now are black car service um, drivers. Uh, they're still taxi cabs, but not that many companies around. You don't see them. They're not as prevalent as they used to be. But it ties into what I was talking about earlier. You know, nothing lasts forever. You never know what may happen that may disrupt your industry. You may think your industry can never be disrupted. You may think your industry is impenetrable from disruption, but as time goes on as tech and, and technology advances, we see that anything can be disrupted. It doesn't matter. And, you know, I've come to the realization of that. Ten years ago, there's a lot of different industries and a lot of things that I've seen disrupted that if you would have asked me prior I would have not believed it. I would have argued it. I would have argued it. I would have said, if you would have t told me about, if you had a time machine, you could go into the future and 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 see where we are now today with the taxi cab industry and the ride share industry, I wouldn't have believed you if you would have told me this in 05. I would have said, so you mean to tell me people are going to get in strangers' car, their private personal car? No, no, no. People aren't going to do that. They're going to take taxi cab because they're yellow. They're marked. They they got the number, the taxi cab company with the phone number of the cab. These cab drivers in some places, they got to pay. They have to pay for the medallion in New York. The medallion cost a million dollars. So these are people that have vested interest into their business and they're not going to do anything foolish because these are professional people. So you mean to tell me that you went to the future and the taxi cab industry was damn near non-existent and people are jumping into strangers' cars. I wouldn't have believed you. 
But that's just one of the industries now that I seen get disrupted that I wouldn't have believed years prior. And here we are today. So, you know, nothing is off the table to me anymore. And I understand it. And anything that I invest into, um, I have this in the back of my mind. You know, I'm looking to get in things. I'm looking to get out of them. I'm looking to get in things, make money, roll that money over, get out of it, and find the next narrative that's running, whether it be artificial intelligence, whether it be real world assets. If it was 2020, I was heavy into the EV investment in EV because that was the narrative that was playing out then. Infrastructure. You know, if we go to war, then I'm going to be looking in the war companies, Palantir. I'm going to go, listen, before I get out, I'm going to always follow the money. Wherever the money is, I'm going to follow it. Whatever the next play is, the next narrative, I'm going to be an early investor. I'm looking for the next narrative. Why? Because I want to be an early ado adopter. I want to be in on this stuff pry early so I can get these things at a cheaper cost and I can sell it to somebody else at a higher cost. If real estate, if I see, okay, boom, in 2026, we're going to flip it from a seller's market to a buyer's market in real estate, I'm going to start buying. I'm going to already have my cash on hand to buy. I'm going to be in preparation. If I find that out this year to two years from now, something is going to happen that, you know, uh, property is going to be dirt cheap, not as cheap as it was in 09 and 2010 and 2011, 2012 after 2008, but cheap enough with adding inflation to the point where we can cash out on some stuff right now, then guess what? I'm going to start dollar cost averaging every day money to the side to, to play that narrative in 2006 for real estate as a buyer until it becomes a seller's market. Now, if it becomes a seller's market five, 10 years after I've made my money from section eight these units out, making my money, I've already made back my initial investment. I'm in pro I'm in profit now and it becomes a seller's market. Now I can sell something at, at a 10 X that I bought 10 years prior to 10 X I'm selling it. I'm out. And I'm going to pull that money back and I'm going to I'm going I'm I'm to store it somewhere where I can get a good APY until I'm ready to send it back out to make some more money. So it goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Thinking ahead. I'm thinking ahead. I'm not thinking now. If you thinking now as a business owner, you thinking wrong. You're supposed to be thinking down the line. That's how you stay ahead. I'm damn near in 2025. I'm in mentally, I'm in October. I'm thinking ahead. I'm thinking about exit strategies right now out of some of the investments that I'm in. Jerome Powell saying one thing, but he's showing another. So yeah, I I I, I yeah. <laughs> I'm following the money, always following the money. <sighs> Kaza says capitalism. Kaza, people laugh at me when I say this, but mark my words: in ten to twenty years, Amazon will not be the powerhouse that it is. And you know what? You know, Amazon is one of those companies that, you know, I think, you know, people at one point thought. And I'm going to say this before I get out of here. Listen. Anything can be surpassed. Anything can be put out of business. We're seeing that now. Amazon is not exempt from making bad decisions. For example. A few years ago, Amazon introduced Amazon Go, right? It's a stores, it's a concept grocery store where you go in and you put things in carts and these things had sensors and, you know, your Amazon account was linked to the sensor. I never went in one, I'm just going off, you know, 
watching the the videos that Amazon put out. You go in the store, you pick stuff up, and it automatically adds it to your card. And then when you walk out the store, it charges your Amazon account. Obviously, your card is tied in. So Amazon Go, we have a few of them here. I think they're still here. There were a few here. I don't know if they're still here. I, I don't. I don't. I don't go in those stores. But here's the technology behind that. And here is why you may not see those stores anymore. The technology is early AI driven, not current AI driven. And they hired thousands of people in India to monitor the AI technology that pushes those stores, right? That pushes those stores, that drive those stores. Now we're in 2024 and we have open AI and we have AI technology that's so more far advanced that the technology that they have for those stores is prehistoric and it's costing them a lot of money because they're paying people to monitor the individual AI to push those sales and those charges through when the AI that's out there now, you don't need those people. So those store, that whole build out, I think they're about to trash it. Go look it up. Go read it. I'm not making this up. I read it. I read. Why? Because I invest. So, yeah, Jeff Bezos ain't exempt from making mistakes. He spent a lot of money on this Amazon Go concept, and now it's worthless because technology has advanced that much in just a few years to the point where the technology that he has is 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 useless and it's costing him more money to do it the old way than just investing in new technology because there's still humans that have to monitor that early ai technology for those amazon go stores so it could be a guy like sam altman who is the founder of open AI, who may not be as a savvy businessman as a Jeff Bezos, but he's smarter technologically than Jeff Bezos because he creates, he's an individual that creates the technology that a person like Jeff Bezos would have to buy into to drive his ideas forward. It's a guy like Sam Altman to you know, further prove your point, that would be an individual that could create technology that could also, or create, you know, ideas that could also that that could put a person like Jeff Bezos out of business. Listen, there's always somebody in the basement cooking up. After Jordan came, Kobe. After Kobe, we got LeBron. They was in during the same time, but LeBron took the torch and carried it. LeBron was watching Mike back in the days. I don't care what industry you're in, it's always somebody that's cooking up. The next generation, it may be lazier, but it's those pick of the litter, those few that are going to be smarter, that's going to take that torch and push technology further. So yeah, I believe you. Something's gonna come out that's gonna surpass Amazon. It's, it's inevitable. There's gonna be an individual who thinks more outside of the box, who's more technolo technologically savvy, who's more logistically savvy than a Jeff Bezos. You no, know, Jeff Bezos came in and he pushed a lot of people out of business. He ended a lot of people's careers. There's not that many Sam Waltons. Sam Walton was an early adopter who saw everything down the line and understood logistics, which is why he could come to towns and put all the mom and pops out of business and strategically place dcs within certain 
mouths and put stores in in certain uh, areas and certain markets and then have the D.C. strategically placed X amount of miles from where he strategically placed uh, uh, these stores and understood outsourcing, but also understood in-house. Also understood family. Family dynamic. Shelf space. Charging for shelf space. How where your item is placed on the shelf is more brand awareness, so you have to pay for this. It's going to be hard to displace a guy like Sam Walton. Now, the Waltons, you know, they didn't play the World Wide Web narrative the way they should have played it. But the brick and mortar, it's going to be hard to move them out the way. It's going to be hard to move them out the way. So, man, you said Walmart's just crushing it. Yeah, yeah. They, they, and it's going to be hard. Like I said, it's going to be hard to displace them. It just, you know, his, um, the way he visioned it and the way he implemented it, even today, it's, it's going to be hard to, to, and that's why a company like Amazon that 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 could do it, they have the capital to do it. They're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. The Waltons are too far gone. Even during high inflation, you see prices go up in Walmart, but not at the amount that you see them go up in some of these other big box retail grocery chains. And I've also seen prices start to retrace. Another thing is they have their own line, great value. You just you just can't you just can't compete, but but Amazon, yeah, somebody could come in and 15 20 years from now and displace that. Yeah, for sure. Only crazy people think things stay the same. They talk about 1994, 2004, 2004, and don't realize that 2024 is also a year some people in 2034 will be saying was the best they ever had. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that comes with just time, experience of living, and then as far as being a business owner, you kind of, you know, you get a snap into reality as well. I got my snap into reality uh, Costas is in here. Uh, obviously, he's he's lived it. I've lived it. Um, you know, we're old enough. We've seen it happen in business. Um, you just have to stay ahead, and that's why I always preach. You know, early adopters and thinking ahead. You got to think ahead. If you are just focusing, focus on the current and the now. You're just putting your you're slowly putting yourself out of business. You have to stay ahead. You have to. You have to. You you just have to. So it is what it is. That's why you got to get in, make your money, reinvest it, reinvest it into, back into the business, small percentages into other things, and set a timeline um, so that when things do occur, you can see it a mile away. You can start your exit strategy. So... Do I think a valet trash company would be a good business to start? They're building more and more apartment complexes. Somebody asked me this question a few months ago. I had never heard of it before, and I looked into it and realized that some buildings were using it. Um, I think that's a a niche play to certain areas and certain buildings. Obviously, a building that uh, you know where you know, obviously a building where. A, 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 a prominent building where you have people paying a lot of money in rent. You have a certain clientele of renters 
would probably pay for a service like that or if it was implemented into their rent, you know, to raise the cost of the rent, they would pay some stuff like that. But if if you're living in an economical building, you know, an urban area and it's not in a predominant, you know, affluent area, then I don't think this is something that is going to play out. Would I invest into something like that? Probably not. Because that could be just a something that just sh a short term uh, 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 sector that's new. And, you know, if we go into some type of economical downturn and people have to start cutting things, then that's something that is going to be cut. Like, you know, I'm paying X amount of dollars for someone to take my garbage to the incinerator or the compactor. Uh, you know, I lost my job or you know, cost of living is going up, but I, my, my wages aren't going up. You know what? I got to start making cuts. Then guess what? I'm going to be walking my garbage down to the trash compactor myself. I can save this 30, 40, 50 dollars, whatever it is a month. That's something that's going to be on the top of the chopping block. You know? So, you know, I say when you look into starting a new business, you want to look into something that you're going to have some form of longevity it's not something that or you, you want to look for something that's not, you know, you want to you want to look for something that has an all around use case, you know, where it's something where everybody can utilize this. It's something that is not, you know, targeting a minority demographic. You know, if you're going to target a minority demographic, then I say target a minority demographic with a with a startup business that you're making a large amount of money. You know, if you if you got an idea, uh, if you found a void and it targets a very small niche demographic, then it needs to be an idea where you're making a lot, a lot of money off of it. But something like that where it's a minimal amount of money, but it does target a specific demographic. It targets a demographic that can afford to have somebody walk their garbage down the hallway. If we go into another recession or something like that. People will cut that out. It's not a necessity. It's a luxury. You want to invest into something that people are going to need. You want to invest into a necessity driven business not a luxury driven business that's a luxury for me to pay somebody to come walk my trash down to the the compactor that's a luxury for me to pay to have the little ladies to come in here and clean up that's a luxury i could clean up myself and marky mark hits hard times or something that's gonna be on the top of my chopping block i'm gonna go under the sink i'm gonna cut the little old polish ladies off the the uh, Marie and them, no, I don't need you. That one fifty, I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna go under the cabinet. I'm gonna go get that 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 Lysol spray, the lemon. I'm gonna go get that bleach spray. I'm gonna get, get me a one a scrub, daddy. And Marky Mark gonna be in here scrubbing sinks and toilets. Those are luxuries. Those get cut first. So you want to invest into a necessity driven business. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, you want to invest into a necessity driven business. You don't want to invest into something that's luxury. If I'm paying for somebody to come take my trash out and I come up on hard times, that's going to get cut. I wouldn't pay nobody to come walk my trash down. That's just to me, that's just a waste of money. Like, yeah, I don't understand why. Like, when I heard about that business, I didn't believe it. And when I looked it up, I said, man, people are paying people. So you you fill your garbage up, you leave your trash outside of your door, and then some random person gets the thing, the ding on his phone or whatever, he drives to your condo or drives to your apartment, comes in the building, takes your trash, and walks it four doors down to wherever the incinerator the compactor is and just drops it down to shoot and then goes on why didn't you just walk it down there yourself why are you paying for this but you know to each his own if people want to pay for that stuff then god bless them i'm not paying nobody to do that so but it is what it is but i, I wouldn't invest into it me personally
uh mark but unfortunately more people are lazy and they want something easy so they don't have to walk all the way to well you know guess what eventually those lazy people un un unless they're filthy filthy rich you know economic challenges occur and what i'm 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 the reason why I'm answering the question the way I'm answering it is because you have to keep that in mind. When you when you set out to start a business, you want to start something where it's necessity driven. You want to start a business that is necessity driven. Luxury business will get played out at the first economic downturn. The first economic downturn, a luxury business they will hey we don't need you this month we don't need you so uh they have the service in my neighborhood and the price is automatically taken out of your rent and there's no option to opt out well yeah yeah i, I don't know i i've I, you know, I, I, somebody asked me about it a few months ago. I, I never heard of it. I researched it, found out it does exist. Um, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily start the business, though, because here's the thing. OK, the business, the, the buildings, you know, they have it. But I mean, if they get a lot of complaints of the rent and they need to decrease rent or whatever the case may be, we the pandemic comes, let's say we don't have another pandemic, but something else comes and people are economically challenged and they have to be more competitive. The market determines that the rent prices should go stay the same because they rarely go down, but let's say stay the same. And in order to do that, they have to cut some things and that, that'll be one of the things that get cut. You know, I don't see at least in the near future, whether we face a recession or we don't, that if I went out and started a a, va a garbage valet business or I went out and started a, a, a grocery delivery business via, uh, you know, an account or maybe moonlighting uh, off an app and I go out and buy me a tr just a standard cargo van, a Ford Transit T-150, just a basic standard cargo van, for twelve, thirteen thousand dollars, whether it's a a, a a a economic downturn, a recession, or not, people are going to go on Amazon Fresh. People are going to go on Kroger.com. People are going to go on whatever grocery store app and order groceries and have to get them delivered. Why? Because food is a necessity, and whether they go to the store and purchase their own food or they get it delivered, there's going to still be people that get it delivered. That's something that I know I can pretty much count on more so than garbage valet. Now, I know the entry cost is going to be higher, but I'd rather pay a higher entry cost with something that I know, you know, during an economic downturn, I'm going to be safe. So, you know, I don't want to get anything that, you know. When people ain't got it, this is going an industry that's going to get carved out. So, yeah, most apartments built apartments built today are income driven, affordable housing. Yeah, so you know, I you know, anything can happen. You know, the housing market, the rental market is competitive, just like the trucking market. You know, so right now you got this whole squatting thing. Said trash isn't going anywhere. It ain't going nowhere, but guess what? It is going somewhere. It's got to go to the trash can outside of my unit. Now, whether I walk it down there or somebody else come walk it down there, I'm just, I'm just giving you, I'm looking at it from a business perspective. I'm looking at it from my perspective as, a, as an investor. If I came in and I had a choice between those two businesses, me personally, I would, I wouldn't, me personally, I mean, Everybody is welcome to do what they want. I'm just giving from my perspective, me personally. Um, I can see that sector getting cut.
if 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 I own property, I'll give you another scenario. If I own property and the city goes up on my taxes, right? And I know if I I go up on my tenants, you know, you know, with what I gotta go up on my tenants to 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 absorb this tax this tax hike, I might not want to go up because I still want my units to be competitive on the market. So where can I cut so that I can absorb this tax hike without going up too much on my tenants, if at all? So if I got a garbage valet that I'm implementing into the cost structure of my tenants rent, if I reduce that and just let my tenants take the garbage down to the dumpster they sell, now I can absorb the tax without having to pass a lot of it on to my tenants. It's, it's just I just I just look at it as a luxury and and from for me just being in business I see luxury industries get really really hit during economic downturns that's just me you know that's just me now there's other lazy industries that I feel during an economic downturn may not be as affected, right? And here's why. We can look at food delivery. For a person to not go pick up their food is different from a person walking down the hallway. Down the hallway, you're still in your building, right? Food delivery, you might consider that lazy, but here's the thing. A person has to get dressed, go outside, go to their car, turn it on, drive it, get out the car, walk into a place, pick up the food, get back into their car, drive back to their building, get out, walk to the building, take the stairs, take the elevator, walk down the hallway, go back into the building. I can see a person paying for a delivery, food delivery, doing an economic downturn then I would see them paying for garbage because they don't have to leave the unit. I'm just, this is what I do. I just compare and contrast, you know, me personally, you know, anybody's welcome to do what they want to do, but you know, you ask me a question, I'm going to answer it the way I would look at it, you know what I'm saying? So, Um, yeah, so that's how I would look at it. The entry cost plus the competition, which causes the rates to go down. You talking about, um, uh, for the garbage thing? Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, Say so you love Whole Foods delivery is very high. I only had Whole Foods delivery one time. It was during the pandemic when I was sick and I couldn't leave the house. Never again. Like me, I like to, me personally, I like to go do my grocery shopping. Why? Because I like to pick my own fruits and I like to pick my own vegetables. I don't want to trust. You know, I be seeing when I be in a grocery store, I be seeing these guys, you know, doing the, you can tell who's doing the, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, Instacart because they walking around with their phone and it's like they get doing a grocery list shop. They don't know where nothing is at. They move around because this isn't stuff that they would traditionally buy for themselves. So when I see them picking the fruits and the vegetables, they ain't picking up the tomatoes and seeing if it if, if it if it got a dent in it or if it's peeled a little bit or if it's if it's soft in a certain area. They just grabbing the tomato and throwing it in the basket. No, I need to look at my tomatoes. I need to fill them. When I get my bananas, I like to get my bananas slightly green because I don't eat them right away. If I get a bunch of six bananas, it might take me all six days to eat them. So I don't want them to go bad. So I like to get mine a little green. See what I'm saying? I'm picky. When I pick my kale, I go through my kale. I don't. I want the good bunch of kale because they charge you by the pound. So I want to get something that, you know, ain't too much and it ain't too cheap because I'm just juicing it anyway. 
when I pick my beats, I don't want the beats with all the mud and stuff on them. I want to get a nice beat that's, when I cut it, I slice into it, I, the juice going to come out. I don't need one of these guys picking my, my stuff for me. So me personally, I go to the grocery store and I, I get my own food. But there are people that rather pay for that service. But that's a necessity because people got to eat. Yeah, Axel, you know you're gonna get kicked out. You go, you know, you know we're gonna put you on timeout, man. We will put you on timeout. Calvin said people pay for convenience. Yeah, but we're not talking about from a consumer perspective. We're talking about it from a business perspective. And longevity from a business perspective. You have to look at it. Uh, will this sector that you're going into because w w will it stand the test of time? Will it stand the test of time? So that's how I would look at it. If I, me personally, I, listen, everybody could do what they want. This is just a dialogue. Person asks a question, I'm answering it. You get to do what you want to do. But me personally, I would look at it and I, me personally, I wouldn't invest into it. I wouldn't invest into it. Now, if it's a solo business, you know, whatever, a gig type of thing. Now, if this was a gig thing that fell under a, a gig app, like a task rabbit or maybe a thumbtack and it had a category, I think that's where this sector would probably fit the best. Instead of building out a structured business for this. If a person goes on an app, I need somebody to come take my shit down the hallway. And then this should be a, 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 a category on Task Rabbit for somebody to come do that. And then you would just it, under like freelancer or an errand guy or something like that. Like, I wouldn't build out a structured business for that. You know, me personally, but, you know, to each his own. Uh, uh, when you are out and about and someone asks you, are you in a class? Uh, let me see. All right, I think it's it's up and down, and they're, like every business, I'm here in Dallas. They're building luxury complexes every day. <laughs> see, we can see this conversation will go on a lot, so that's why I'm gonna end it. Because even with the luxury complexes, like we can talk about that. I've seen a lot coming from a moving business perspective. Like a lot of these complexes that you see a lot of these people moving in, because see, we're living in a time period where people want to live, work, and play in the same community, right? So now you got a lot of these luxury high rises, which really aren't luxury. Like we can do the talk. We can do the talk. I'm in, I'm in Chicago. I'm in the area with a lot of these buildings. There's a building Nima, not far from me, down the street from me. They built this building, Nima. You can look it up on the internet. It's the amenities. The units, the apartments look like any other modern apartment that's being built and put on the market right now. It's the amenities. A lot of the people that are moving into these units can't afford to live in them. I've seen it. You know how many one bedroom apartment moves I've walked into? What was two, three people living in there? High rise downtown Chicago, four, five thousand dollars a month. All because 
They want to live, work, and play. But as soon as one person decides that they don't want to pay their share no more, up, oh, we got to give it up. Why y'all moving? Well, roommate decided he didn't want to pay no more. A roommate met a girl, and him and this girl are going to move in together, so we're going to let it go because we can't afford to pay it with just us two. All these buildings that they build in are considered luxury. Why? Because they put a basketball court in them now. They put an Olympic swimming pool in them. They put a, 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 a workout gym that looks better than the gym that you go to where you pay $150 a month membership. They got a cold plunge in the building. They got a sauna in the building. They got a tennis court on the roof. They got uh, an event space that you sign up. You can get it for free if you want to throw parties up on the roof and it looks like a club and you got the disco lights and all that you got the skyline view this is what they selling you on but when you go look in the unit looks like any unit that had a full gut rehab yesterday it's the same and i know this shit i haven't been in a million spots it's the same ikea fixtures it's the same ikea the, either the brown one or the white one where you can screw a light in the bottom or you can screw a light in the top. It looks good, but it's from Ikea. It's the same fixture. It's the same cabinetry. It looks good. You may have floor to ceiling windows. You get a view. But they're selling you on the amenities. And like I said, and I'm not hating, I'm being honest. I've done thousands of moves. I've met thousands of customers. I've met thousands of parents that are paying the rent for their kids. A lot of people that move into these buildings, they can't afford to live in them. To pay four or $5,000 a month for rent, how much money are you thinking you got to make? These guys that's working at Schwab, Deloitte, all these guys, they love to go work for Deloitte. Citadel. All these corporate companies, these big marketing firms, Burrell. The list goes on. I could name a bunch. Fulton Market District definitely has a high toner turnover. Fulton Market District does have a high turnover. Why? Because it's a lot of money to live in the Fulton Market District. They want to live, work, and play over there because this is why, why I talk about all your experience-driven restaurants are over in that area. So they live over there. They work over there because Google is right there on Morgan Street. And then they play over there because you got Girl in the Goat, Noble, all those restaurants are right there, but they can't afford the rent. This is why the rent, and this is proving my point. This is why the turnover is high. This is why we will move them in in the summer of 2020 and move them out in the summer of 2021. And then when you move them out in the summer of 2021, they don't move into something comparable to where you move them out of. You move them into Ukrainian village, into a third floor walk up or into a garden unit. Why? Because they had to humble themselves. Reality struck in about three or four months in. That 4,000 kicking your ass. Yeah, you got 4,000 more rent, but you want to go to Nobu. Oh, yeah, you want to walk to Nobu and meet the chick. Oh, I live right around the corner. You live around the corner? Yeah, but that's expensive because now Nobu is expensive. The rent is expensive. Yeah, you work at Google right there. But you're not making that type of money. 
So now you got to get your, 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 your buddy to move in with you. And he got to sleep, uh, make a pallet. You know what I mean? Spots we went into in Fulton Market District or downtown. You got the bedroom and then you see two pallets on the floor in the living room. I went into a unit that was a one bedroom that had six pallets. These was all medical students. It wasn't downtown. wasn't in. A, it was in High Park. It was in Regents Park. Six pallets in a one bedroom. I'm not making this up. I've seen it. See, that's the luxury of this. Is why I can talk. Only the moving company. I ain't seen some wild shit. You thinking you going into a building? You thinking when you go upstairs, you gonna see uh, Andy Warhol's on the wall? You thinking you gonna see uh uh goddamn uh bare bricks on the goddamn uh uh coffee table if you don't know what a bear brick is go look it up andy warhol uh not the originals obviously on the wall you think you're gonna see some fly stuff when you get up in there and when you get up there you see a bed in the bedroom you may see a pallet in the living room the roommate you see a futon in the living room you see a big TV, it's always a big TV. It may be sitting on the floor or it may be sitting on one of those, uh, you go to Target, you go to Walmart and you get the little the little TV stand in the box and you got to put it together, but it's not real wood, it's press on wood. They got the TV sitting on one of them uh, TV stands that you got to put together. And that's it. And this is four or $5,000 a month. You expect it to be laid. far from it buddy the apartment was 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 rented because individual a wanted to live work and play People really couldn't afford it so that's why i'm saying like and I'm, I'm speaking from my background of being a moving owner just because an individual is in you know said building Listen, as many luxury buildings have I been into, rentals, you never see what you would expect. Now, when you go into luxury condo buildings, it's different. You go into a luxury condo building, what you see is what you're going to expect. Why? It's a different buried entry, just like what we talked about earlier. You got an owner versus a renter. The mindset is different. You go into a luxury condo building, it's laid. You got art. You got white sofas, white throw rugs, white throw pillows. Hardwood floor, spotless. Not a scratch nowhere. The paint on the wall look like look like velvet. Not a speck of dust nowhere. Glass showers. Frameless. The shit that I got. Frameless glass showers. a different ball game two different individuals two different niches two different mindsets so when I talk about economic challenges the cutbacks as a property manager and a landlord When things got to get made, cut. Necessities aren't going to get cut. Luxuries are. I live in a condo building. And I remember when the board of directors got mad at the owners 
for not cleaning up by, behind a dog. We got a dog run on the roof. So if you got a dog in a building, you don't have to take your dog outside. You can go up to the roof. It's a dog run up there. Your dog can run on the roof. You got the skyline, downtown skyline. You can be up on the roof, enjoy the skyline while your dog runs on the dog run and poop. But you got to clean it up. You know what happened when people stop cleaning up after their dog? And the company that comes and cleans up the building, the janitorial that our kind of association dudes that we pay every month go towards and they had to start doing it. You know what they did? They closed the dog run. So now all the owners with dogs, they had to take their behinds outside the building and walk their dogs around the neighborhood. They didn't have the convenience anymore of the dog run amenity that the building has built on the roof because they didn't want to pay the janitorial service an additional fee to clean up people's dog shit. Or increase our assessments to cover the cost of paying the janitorial service to clean up people's dog shit. Why? Because that's a luxury. You don't, we don't have to have a dog run on the roof. You can walk your dog outside. That's a luxury to be able to stay in the building, go up to the roof, see the view, and all that shit. It's a luxury. That's not a necessity. Who said that Mark living with Matt? Mark lives downtown Chicago. Mark doesn't live in Wilmette. Mark lives downtown Chicago. So that's just an example of luxuries getting cut. Now they open it back up. But that's a luxury. I can get cut. It's not a necessity. That's just like them saying, oh, well, we're going to cut janitorial. They ain't going to clean the hallways. They ain't going to clean the elevators. They're not going to mop. They're not going to do this, clean the garages and clean the floor mats, the entry doorway, clean the glass and the entry door, whatever they do during the day. No, because that's a necessity. You can't cut that. You know, so they definitely will, you know, you – Whenever I invest into things, I always look at, I really do a deep dive analysis of, uh, you know, stuff like that, you know, so, you know, to each his own. Now, Will May, no, it's all good. Listen, ain't nothing wrong with Will May. Actually, I'm thinking about moving out the city. I'm actually looking in South Barrington. I think I'm, you know, I said I'd never move out of the city, but right now I'm thinking about buying a house in Barrington. I'm thinking I want to be away from the city. Now I got to the point now where I, you know. So, you know, I like the city, but I'm starting to get, you know, the older I get, the less tolerant, you know, I just, I just get, you know, uh, some of the stuff that I'm seeing, man, is just, to me, it's crazy. I just see some crazy stuff, man. You know, downtown Chicago, ain't, I remember downtown Chicago, you know, you like some of the shit that go on all over the city, like downtown Chicago was always off limits. But some of the stuff that people come downtown to do now, some of the stuff, donuts in the middle of Michigan Avenue, uh, lighting the street on fire, cutting off traffic, cutting off the expressway, doing donuts with him. Like a lot of this stuff to me is like, like, it's crazy. So, you know, these youngins, man, I I don't know. I don't know how much longer I can deal with them. I, I don't know, bro. So, you know, they like to come from, you know, downtowns where all the scenic and they, you know, I know they're doing it for content so they can do it in front of some of the buildings, the skyline, the bean and stuff like that. But, you know, it's driving a lot of businesses out of downtown, 
outside of the fact that, you know, rent is sky high, like we lost Grand Lux, we lost Ruth Chris downtown, we lost Macy's in the Water Tower, Michigan Avenue, 30% vacant, State Street, if you, from State Street and Adams to State Street and Monroe, both sides of the streets are vacant. A whole block on both sides of the streets, all the storefronts are vacant. And I can remember being a kid walking the stretch from State and, you know, maybe from State and Harrison, from let's say like the Harold Washington Library, all the way to like State and Lake. Every single storefront on both sides would be filled. Now it's like a ghost town for two or three blocks. So, you know, Michigan Avenue, you're looking at, Water Tower lost Macy. That's eight floors of that's an anchor store that had eight floors that brought all the foot traffic into the mall to go to the other stores. So now you got other stores that are failing because of the loss of foot traffic because Macy's is gone. You know, all those restaurants that are gone. The Gap is gone. Express is gone. Roof Chris is gone. Grand Lux is gone. Uh, Lori's is gone. Uh, uh, what else is gone? I think Express is gone. Top Shop is gone. Uh, 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 what else? What else? Uh, Brooks Brothers left. Uh, I'm just going down the street thinking. Um, uh, 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 not uh, the Gap. What's the Banana Republic is gone. That Chinese store that took over where uh, Filene's basement. That's gone. That used to be Fao Schwartz, and they left back in the day when I was. A sh All that stuff is gone. And these are our two prime, you know, districts. So it's a combination between the rent getting going up, but also the smash and grabs. How many, how long can these businesses survive smash and grabs before they just say, you know what? All right, bet. We out of here. You drive down Michigan Avenue coming from a club, or whatever, at two, three in the morning, you see private security. Like somebody got to pay for that. When does that cost become too costly to the point where they say, you know what, we're paying for private security to make sure we don't go through another smash and grab at three, four in the morning to the point where, you know what, we just gonna say to hell with it. <clears throat> we, we done, we, we not gonna pay increased rent, pay overnight security, and it's not worth it, we out of here. Signature room gone, right, signature gone. You know, so, you know, a lot of a lot of places are gone. So nothing lasts forever. And it, this is not another testament to what I said earlier. It don't necessarily have to be to you. It don't even have to be to a, 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 a economic downturn caused by a, 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 something like a pandemic. It don't have to be technology driven. It could be just the culture driven. So here's another narrative that we're looking at that could cause a business's demise. Look at the culture, how the culture has changed. That's forcing people to go out of business, restaurant chains and retailers to go out of business or closed stores because the culture. Who told these people? Listen, It's to the point now where people, and I swear to God, I can show you pictures. It's stores here that are getting big ass boulders, like big rocks that are about three feet high, maybe four feet wide. And they're putting it in front of their store so that these people can't ramp. The way they do it here is they'll steal like a pickup truck or they'll steal like a SUV in the middle of the night. They'll just drive the whole truck straight through the, through, through the front door straight through the glass, just bust down the whole facade in the front, drive it through, and then they'll just grab whatever they want and run out the store. And then they had getaway cars waiting. So what the stores are doing now is they putting these big boulders in front of their store so that, you know, these guys can't drive through. But that's an eyesore. Burberry ain't finna do no ghetto shit like that. Gucci not finna do that. Louis ain't finna do that. Saks ain't finna do that. Neiman's ain't finna do that. Before they do that, they'll just say, all right, we done, we gone. So now that's a bunch of jobs that are being lost. Um, that's another vacant spot. So that's less revenue from the landlords. 
for the landlord, whoever owns that property. That's less money coming into the city, right? Because this is a tourist strip. And the more uh, vacant it becomes, the less touristy it will be. So it's driving revenue away. But the bigger picture is you got businesses that are going out of business or leaving. Nothing lasts forever. Who would ever thought that narrative would have came? Well, man, we're going to come to a point uh, in the, the early 2020s where, man, it's going to be something called smash and grab and they're going to hit your store. Well, they might hit us when our insurance cover, but that's okay. As soon as you get the glass and the windows put back in and the doors put back up and you spend 100000 building out the facade on the front, they're going to wait three more weeks and then they're going to hit your ass again. It stores there and hit three, four times. And then on top of that, you're going to get the whole, this, it's going to be, uh, Biden going to start flying these illegal uh, aliens in from Hon Honduras and Venezuela and Guatemala, and then they're going to start coming in your store still in two. So now you're going to have man man in them from old block smashing your stuff, running in there stealing, right? Going into Canada goose stealing and, and, and Louis Vuitton running a pickup truck through the front door stealing, but then you're going to have Jose from Guatemala, Guata, whatever, Venezuela coming in there in broad daylight and just picking something up and walking out and daring you to say something to do something. So, so that go another that go another narrative that you can add to uh, the equation. So once your last one graduates, you gone too? Yeah, man. I don't know, man. I'm thinking about it, man. So I live in Beachwood, Cleveland, where Saks is at. The, that mall is closing down because kids flash mob and shootings. You make me wonder, is peaceable living possible in the U.S.? I think it is. I just think we're just going through a culture a culture change. Uh, what dri drove this culture? It's a few different things. I think one was the pandemic. I think the complacency of the pandemic. The riots during the pandemic due to George Floyd, um, I just think, you know, and the way a lot of people handled it across the country, it was just allowed. Um, you couple that with all the free money that was given that introduced uh, people to uh, things that they never, you know, you know, got a chance to experience before. Um, also items that they never would have been able to purchase before so now you know it's just like a drug you give a person a bunch of free money there was never a line at the gucci store the louis store now there's a line at the gucci and the louis store but there's nowhere to go because everything is closed so why are people standing in line to get gucci and louis why because they got a 20 piece courtesy of the federal government so now they want to go get drip they never had gucci before in their life But that first time they went into the Gucci store and they got to experience it. How you doing? You like a, they walking around giving them a glass of champagne. They sliding them Gucci sneakers on for the first time. Or they going in the sacks and they sliding them Dior's on for the first time. And it's like it's a different feeling. The customer service is different in sacks than it is in Foot Locker. The customer service in Neiman's is different than it is in Dr. J's or Jimmy Jazz or snipes or dtlr the customer service in louis vuitton is different than it is in champs so now that experience they want to relive that experience again it's like a person who take that hit for the first time it's a euphoric feeling or that person who has sexual intercourse for the first time it, they chasing that same feeling but now that money ain't there no more but they want that same feeling. They want to walk back into Gucci. They want to walk back into Louis. They want to walk back into Saks. You can't miss what you never had, but once you had it, you want to re-experience again. Why? Because the chicks looked at them a little bit different when they had them Dior's on. Yeah, you keeping up with the retro mics is one thing, but when you go drop thirteen hundred on some 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 B twenty twos or some B twenty threes, they're gonna look at you a little bit different. What was the shoe? The the pandemic shoe, the Alexander McQueen, 
Everybody had them Alexander McQueen's on. They looked at you a little bit different. You went and threw another 500. You got you a belt. Got you a Versace belt with the Medusa hair. You in the game. You got looked at a little bit different. They looked at you a little bit different than they looked at you when you had on that 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 that, that team jacket and them, them retro mics. She didn't. She didn't. She wasn't as hesitant to give you that number at that Instagram. She looked at you up and down and she said, oh, that's about 3,000. He got about 3,000 on. Let me see what he about. So they want to relive it. So they're going to relive it by hook or crook, by any means necessary. So if they got to steal your, your truck in the middle of the night or take you up out of it because they finna drive it straight through the front door, so that they can get some shit so that they can put on and they can sell the rest on the black market on Facebook marketplace or offer up or wherever so they can get a bag. And that's what they're going to do. So it was a combination between the pandemic, the free money, the, the, the riots and how easily and accessible it was for them to do it. Because here our mayor said, just let them do it. Don't fight back. Just let them take it. Oh, man, it became what we call here is sweet. So they want to, you know, continue to do it. Now it's messed up out here. Ain't no money out here. And people are going to do whatever they got to do to survive. And ultimately, that's going to drive businesses out. It's going to close businesses down. Business is going to suffer from tremendous loss. And, 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 and. It plays into what we talked about at the earlier part of the stream that nothing lasts forever. You know, there's a bunch of different ways things can can end. It's just you when you start a business, you have to have that time frame in your mind because things are moving a lot quicker now due to technology and some other things. But you may have a cultural thing that may just just tear out, tear a hole in a whole sector. So it is what it is, man. Uh, March, Mark, much bigger issue. I hate because this has created such division and hostility. It has, man. But you know, I mean, what, what, what can you do? You know, what can you do, man? You just gotta keep moving forward and um, continue to think ahead and listen, man. You know, I wish I could be mayor or president for a day. I clean a lot of shit up, but I can't. So, so at the end of the day, and I wouldn't give a damn. I heard a lot of people's feeling. I'm arresting parents. Listen, if I was the mayor of Chicago, I'm arresting parents. Let me catch your kid out here doing some dumb shit. Let me catch your kid out here flash mobbing and robbing people. Let me catch your kid downtown Chicago driving a pickup truck, a Ford F-150 through the front door of Burberry. All right, bet. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to go on the news. I'm going to say, listen, we catch your kid doing some dumb shit. If you got a 14, 15, 16-year-old kid, we catch him doing dumb shit at 1, 2, 3 in the morning, we coming to get you because he should be in the house anyway. He's a minor. So we're going to come arrest the parent. We're going to arrest the child too. We're going to throw him in juvenile, and we're going to come arrest you, and we're going to throw you an adult. I'm arresting everybody. I'm going to clean the streets up. Oh, man, stop. Right now, we got to break some laws. We got to we gotta break some. We have to do some things that may be a little bit unconstitutional. We're going to have to start stopping frisking again. We're going to have to do some things because right now it's just out of order. Like, like this whole world we living in now, the soft shit where you can't say certain shit and you can't because it may offend somebody and all this third, that and the third. And, you know, this the tough love that was was once you know, around back in the day that you can't do anymore. Like, man, no, that's what we need to get things, you know, back in order because right now people are going to continue to do whatever they want because there's no repercussions behind it. You got kids carjacking people, pulling people out of cars, and in two, three hours, they getting released to the custody of their parents. Nah, somebody got to go to jail, man. Somebody got to go to jail in order for things to uh, get back in order, so... But I, I can't, you know, I, I, 
you know, I know I can't make those decisions. So coming from a business perspective, man, you just got to see where your opportunities are. <laughs> you got to think a little bit different because now you got to keep this stuff in mind when you want to start a new business and you got to kind of keep pushing forward, man. It's, 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 it's sad, but it's reality, man. I appreciate your time tonight. Are you going to live this Friday morning? I might go live this Friday or tomorrow or Saturday. Costas, do I listen to watch Anton? If you talking about Anton Daniels, yeah. I haven't been watching him lately, but uh, I, I try to catch him. I, I try to catch the morning show. He got like three or four shows. I can't watch all of them, but I, I try to catch the morning show. I haven't called him in a f about a three or four weeks now, but yeah, I watch him. I don't, you know, I don't agree with his take on Chicago because I think Detroit, and don't don't get offended if you're from Detroit. Detroit was a shithole for many, 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 many years. There, you know, Detroit is, you know, and Detroit has done really, really well as far as rebuilding that city. But Detroit ain't, ain't too much better than Chicago. So Anton can, you know, you know why Anton is so angry? Because Chicago ruined his childhood, see? That's why he's mad. If if you really sit down and you talk to him and you pick his brain, the reason real the real reason he's mad is because he his childhood was ruined. His childhood was ruined when we put the Pistons out in ninety one, and they didn't shake hands. And Isaiah Thomas and Isaiah Thomas from the crib, and he walked out like a brawl. Anton never never saw a championship come to Detroit in the 90s because Jordan, Jordan, you know, Jordan was here. We ruined them. So his childhood was ruined. That's why he's mad. It has nothing to do with anything else. He could, he could, he could talk about Brandon Johnson. He could talk about Tiffany Henyard. She's out, like she's, that's Dalton. That's not, that's right outside Chicago. He could talk about the migrant crisis, but they got migrants up there. They don't got as many as us. You know, he can talk about all this stuff, but Detroit ain't no better than Chicago. Detroit is goddamn near the scam capital of the United States. Detroit got a lot of work to do. So <laughs> Detroit has a lot of work to do. Shout out to John for that super chat. Mark, help, Pippi gave me a very bad rash. She gave you a rash? Mark, and Isaiah Thomas still wants an apology from Jordan. Clearly, he ain't going to never get it. He ain't going to never get it. <laughs> hey, hey, he ain't going to never get that apology. Isaiah just need to go ahead and... and Go ahead and 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 continue being a commentator or whatever he's doing, and going about his business. Jordan is not going to apologize to that man. Uh. Uh. Said need to start the drive back. I'm working on a project now to get more recruitment locations in inner cities to give our kids the same opportunity. Kids in small. Okay, man. Let me know how that works out for you, man. It's good. You said you can't erase that. You can't erase arrest parents that create a shit storm. Well, I'm a, if I was the mayor, I'd definitely try. Whatever the, the 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 city lawyer, when we hire a lawyer, whatever the lawyer I say I can do and get away with, I'm gonna do it. At this point, listen, I can't speak for every city. I know a lot of cities are under, you know, under duress right now. Uh, you know, Philly is going through it cities that I wouldn't think would be going through it, going through it, like San Francisco. I guess San Francisco. Seattle, Portland. Um, Houston became the new Atlanta. Like, I don't know why people still want to move to Houston. <laughs> Shout out to Houston, though. Houston becoming the new Atlanta, and Dallas is next. Dallas is finna become the new Atlanta slash Chicago. Dallas is... A lot of a lot of people moving to Dallas. So all y'all down in Dallas that grew in Dallas, man, your city finna give it another five years. Your city gonna turn into Houston. Houston is the new Atlanta. Atlanta ain't 
Atlanta done turned into uh 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 the new Chirac. But I, I, I don't know what to do to I know what to do in my city. I know what to do where I can get away with the lawyers. Whatever the lawyers say, if I if I could be mayor. Whatever the lawyers say I, I could do and get away with, I'm going to do it. I want to crack some heads. Listen, when you when y'all arrest people, y'all got to arrest them the old school way. When you putting putting them in the seat, in the back of the seat, you got to make sure you bump their head a little bit. Don't just put them in there all night. When you arrest them. Bump their head. Make sure you bump their head when you put them in. Like, we got to inflict some. Listen, we want you to understand that you can't play under this new administration. The way, the shit that you was able to get away with Lori Lightfoot and, and Brandon Johnson, you ain't going to be able to get away with old Marky Mark if Marky Mark was the mayor. I'm going to be, listen, the young people going to hate me, but the old people going to love me. But guess what? The young people don't vote. The old people do. So I'm, I would come in to make the city safe and to make sure the city safe for, for businesses to thrive so that that money can get kicked back to the city, so that tourism can thrive, so that money can get kicked back to the city, um, and, and so that the city can kind of get back to somewhat of what it used to be. It'll never be, you know, you know, I mean, it's in Chicago. It's always going to be corrupt. It's always going to be dangerous. But that danger has to be somewhat contained and organized. So if we can contain it to specific areas, and if we can get it somewhat back to organized, you know what I'm saying? Then that's what my goal uh, would be. Because if you get crime all, all, if you get rid of crime all the way, then that's a lot of sectors that's going to get cut. We ain't going to need no more judges no more. We're not going to need no more police officers. We're going less. We're going to need less. EMTs, less firemen, uh, you know, j- 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 the whole judicial, you know, branch. We just gonna need less people. So, you know, crime ain't gonna never go anywhere. Why? Because it's a multi-billion dollar a year business, right? But we we at least want to make it safe for old people. A lot of these frivolous and stupid crimes and lack of, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, just lack of care for the elderly and the seniors like man that shit gotta stop that shit gotta stop uh you said mark kids ain't going for that nowadays well see here, here's the thing see i can't talk about my whole plan but just know i got a plan <laughs> listen just know I got a plan. And it's going to have to be, listen, it's always going to be some examples. It's going to have to be some examples that's going to have to, you know, so I, I would never be mayor, but I'm just, you know, you know, talking that if I was mayor, like a fantasy mayor, you know, it's going to be some examples, mate. So, you know, that's what it's going to take. Yeah, and it's going to be controversial, but the old people are going to love me. And the old people are the ones that vote. The young people, they can hate me, but they don't vote. So it don't matter no way, right? <laughs> uh, uh, look at what happened in Portland. San Francisco just deflating. Yes, yeah, it's, it's bad out there. Kamala Harris arrested parents in California for their kids not showing up to school. Wow. So you can arrest parents, huh? OIN just went up 453%. Hmm. Is a box truck business still good to get into? Of course. Of course it is. Of course it is. Uh, appreciate it, Mar. I wanted to see if me and my boss could be on next testimony show you y'all want to do a testimonial you want to do a testimonial you want to do a call in i don't think y'all ready for a testimonial one i don't think y'all unless you want to do a testimonial well ah, y'all y'all gotta email me and let me know what you want to do you want to do a testimonial you want to do a call in you sure you want to do a testimonial (sighs) who's john smith
Well, he's left a super chat. I don't know, but. Who is John Smith? What is he doing? He left a super chat. I see Great Polo erased it. Thanks for joining All Men Intimate Club. <laughs> what? John Smith. Hold on. Let me see. John Smith. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's what I would do if I was mayor, but I'm not. So, you know, you just got to be safe out here in these streets and, um, make sure your loved ones are straight. And, um, if you got, if you got gun, you know, you can carry in your state, make sure you got your, you, 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 you did at all times, you know what I'm saying? And, uh. You know, don't be afraid to exercise your Second Amendment. Mind your business. Uh, uh, if you know you're not supposed to be there, don't go there. Ain't ain't nothing wrong with, you know, if you want to go to Subway and you see man, man, and four of them hanging out in front of Subway, don't try to be tough and walk past man, man, and four of them because they're going to get on your ass. Drive an extra mile to the next Subway. Sometimes, you know, the, the the best way to stay out of trouble is to avoid it, you know? So you got to, you know, be self-aware. Be aware of your surroundings. You know what I'm saying? Because if we continue to get these same people in office, then shit ain't going to get better. It's going to get far more worse before it gets better. All right. So this is how we're going to do this. I appreciate those super chats, but like I, I don't know, like you know, those super chats is cool, but I I can't tolerate you know the trolling, especially this this level of trolling. If it's not trolling to the point where it's educational or somewhat funny, you know, then you know. We we usually let certain things go, but like this level of trolling is it's kind of uh, weird. So we're gonna have to. I had to go ahead and get them up out of here. Um. So he's out of here. I don't know why he's doing it and paying to do it. I don't know, but I I, I got him up out of here. All right. Uh, you'll hold G for this commentary and topic. Truth be told, it's the truth in America. Be well, my G. Peace, King, Cali, and Bill. Shout out to you. Appreciate you, uh, Deshaun. Yeah, man, it's, it's just unfortunate what's going on out here, but it is what it is, man. So, just gotta move around and get used to it and work around it, I guess. I don't want to say we are ready for a testimonial, but all the testimony of our watch, the people get a dose of reality. I believe that's what we need to have for prosperous you understand? Yeah, just just email me or DM me. I'll put my email in the chat. Yes. Let me know when you ready want to do the testimonial. So just email me. Let me know what day. It has to be a Wednesday. If you want to do it next Wednesday, we can do it next Wednesday. If you want to do it the Wednesday after that, we can do it after that, and uh, we'll set it up. So, uh, it says, see, people spend money on the weirdest shit. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Listen. <sighs> Uh, uh. You know, YouTube is cool. I, I like coming on here, just, you know, talking business and stuff like that, obviously, because I could sit here. You know, when the topics get good and we talk about money, like I could sit here and talk all night. But, you know, you know, this ain't an entertainment channel. Like I try to make it somewhat entertainment. I crack jokes and stuff and try to lighten and liven things up. But like. The trolling, like that form of trolling, I just feel like it's not, it just doesn't fit in with what we're doing. Like we're not talking about 
Diddy. We're not talking about things that aren't going to make anybody money. Like there's plenty of lives going on right now where I feel like that type of trolling, you know, I don't think it's warranted at all, but like, you know, we're over here trying to get to the money and, you know, everybody's in the chat helping each other out. I'm giving people, you know, you know, lectures based on my experience and, you know, ways for them to get money and make money and, you know, helping new entrepreneurs, you know, uh, get in the right mind frame and the right mind set for business, you know, from my experience and to me, you know, you know, it doesn't, you know, discourage me from doing it, but it's just, uh, like, I'm just not sitting around, oh, let me go do funny stuff, like the guy that bombed the last live stream or the live stream before last. I don't think we did it last week because it was Easter. The, like, dude, you gonna sit there and wait all that time in the back room to do it? Like, to me, that's just goofy. I, I don't know, man, but, you know, people, you know, I guess they don't be having nothing better else to do, so it is what it is. I don't know. You could be researching, like, some things to make some money. Like, we in the height of a bull market. Like, you know, the stock market is doing good. Crypto market is doing great. You know, we, you know, you could be researching the housing industry to see if it's going to become a buyer's uh, market. You know, there's, there's a lot of other things a person could be doing. It's sitting up here trolling, man. I don't care how old you are. The younger, the better. Why? Because now you can make money and ball out at a, 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 a younger age. Like, man, it's like, I just don't have time for dumb shit, bro. Like, why do people do dumb shit? <laughs> I don't get it, man. Oh. 24K say you got a question, man. I'm trying to get out of here, 24K. I've been on here longer than I, I, I wanted to be. What's your question? I don't even see a question. I scrolled up. Hold on. They ain't just skipped my question. What What is your question? 24K. Write, write your question down again so I can answer it, man, so I can get out of here. Uh, I don't see your question. I'm, I'm scrolling up. I don't see it. You said you surprised I went with a condo instead of a house? I don't need a house. It's just me. I don't want to cut grass. I don't want to shovel snow. You know why? Because I still have to do it for other property. I still got to do it for my OG. Even though I don't cut her grass, I got a service that comes do it, but I go do the snow. So that's not something that I wanted to do here. I thought about a house, but then I said, no, nah, I'm going to get a condo. When, when I'm looking into a house now, but that's because I'm looking to get outside of the city. But I'm also looking to get a house big enough that it can be a family house, but big enough to the point that even if I decided to, let's say if I decided to move my OG with me, the house would be so big that I wouldn't even see her for days. You know what I'm saying? And that's not necessary that I would be there. You know what I'm saying? So something way out the way that, the family can go to. She could go there. I could go there. If I want to get out the city for a couple of days, I can go, but I would still keep my condo, you know, in the city that when I'm in the city, I'm in the city. I might be in the city for three or four days. I might go way out to the boondocks for two or three days, come back to the city. So that's what I'm looking into. You know, I don't necessarily want to get out of the city, but I think I want to have a place where I can get a break from the city sometimes. Like right now, if I had a, crib way out in Barrington somewhere I would have been out there Monday Tuesday like I wouldn't be in the city right now I'd be out there I'll probably come back to the city tomorrow and then be in the city all probably until like Monday morning and then go back out there for a couple of days you know so but yeah I, I, I don't really need a crib so that's why I got a condo so um, now there's a lot of things about a condo that I if I would have known when I bought I probably would have thought a little bit harder you know um like I knew about the fees but I must have not read all the way into the special assessment fees like they can add special assessments at times like I didn't got hit with two special assessments so anytime the building needs something and let's say you know 
whatever it is, it's, it's, you know, let's say it's not in the pot or exceeds what's in the pot to get done, then they put special assessments on the owners. So, you know, depending on, you know, how much square feet you got and a few other parameters determine what the special assessment might cost. It might be a $5,000 special assessment that they might charge everybody and you could pay it up front or you could pay it over the course of two or three years and they add it on. If let's say the roof needs to get fixed and that's going to cost a million dollars. And that is applied to already the assessments that you agreed to pay at closing. And then you can get here with another assessments, depending on like, like this building got six water boilers. If there's a big plumbing project or something and, well, you know, we need to add special assessment. You're going to have to pay another hundred dollars on top of the other two assessments. You got to pay it. See, now, if I'd have known all that, I would have thought a little bit harder. I probably would have still did it, but I would have thought a little bit more into it, right? Because right now they're trying to pass another special assessment and they've been voting on it and voting on it. And I haven't been going to the board meeting, so I, I, I'm i bogus. But I'm going to go to the next board meeting and the 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 owners have been voting against it, but it's something that needs to get done and the board keeps pushing it. So it looks like I'm going to have another special assessment. So this is something that I, you know, but it is what it is. But, um, yeah, so but that's why I got a condo instead of a crib. Uh, uh, you said not that. Then what? Business trends and current event websites. You like business trends? And current event websites current event websites none current event websites to me is like the shade room and stuff like that i don't watch that stuff the most you're gonna catch me on instagram looking at is you know i may check out a few different chicks here and there you know what i'm saying and see if i'm gonna slide you know what i'm saying uh, but like shade room, I don't look at the shade room. I don't go to none of that stuff. Um, now business trends, I would say more like business narratives. So, um, current business trend, I, I spoke on it earlier. You probably came in late AI and real world assets. So those are the two latest business trends or narratives that I'm really interested in. Um, obviously I've talked about AI, you know, um previously um i you know i dropped some hints last year for some just different plays for ai as far as investment some people took key to that information and they've done exceptionally well we're talking about five figures well some people got in late and they're doing well some people listened and didn't get in at all uh but ai um is a good trend or a good narrative that i think is going to be here for quite some time now um it's going to change different landscapes um, in different sectors and in different industries of business. It's also a good investment. Uh, real world assets uh, is probably going to be the next uh, uh, business trend or narrative that's going to make people um, a lot of money. Um, and that's what I'm really looking into and then investing into today. I actually made a, I acquired a real world asset uh, investment earlier today and i'm gonna continue the dollar cost average into that while i you know uh continue to educate myself on real world asset uh going forward um so those are the trends that i'm currently interested in and current events i don't listen to the most you're going to catch me with current events is listening to a content creator like if i catch anton daniels if i catch angry man and they giving they take on diddy or let's say one of my homies or homegirl sent me a link to, you know, maybe a content creator or something uh, that's talking about whatever's current, whether it's Diddy or, you know, Cat Williams or whatever the case may be. I may, you know, glance into it, especially if they ask me for what I think. But that's not what I go to, you know, throughout the day. I, throughout the day, I'm looking for opportunities to make money. That stuff is in between. If I'm sitting on the toilet or something like that, and even if I'm on the toilet, I'm looking, I'm trying to find the money, man. Uh, I'm trying to find the money, man. So, but yeah, I don't have a go-to per se. So. Uh, is it me or just a bunch of Indians brokers? Uh, Yeah, they are.
You said I'm not fooling with you? What are you talking about? I, I, I'm trying to answer as many questions, but y'all keep asking them. I, I want to go to bed. <laughs> so I am skipping over some questions, man. I'm trying to get out of here. When I came on the panel, Mark told me to go to Enterprise and get my money back. Was that you that came on the panel last two weeks ago? And ain't you 34 or something? And I told you, you gave them 5000 I told you go get your money back. Is that you? I think that is you. If that's you, I meant what I said. Listen, I don't say nothing on me. The reason why I told you to do that is because I felt like you gave them your money. Uh, just ignorantly. You didn't, you, you don't have any understanding of what you invested in. You have no understanding of what you're getting yourself into. So I didn't say that. I wasn't joking. I meant every word I said. And I hope you, I hope you, I hope you uh took heed to that advice. <laughs> uh you said that is you, right. Oh, uh, you took my and 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 guess what? They wasted more of my time. See, see, they never really intended on giving you a truck, no way. But see, that's on you. Like that's on you. That's on you for not doing your due diligence. That's on you for not understanding what you're getting yourself into. But the more I think you come to the channel and you listen to some of these live streams and these lectures, I think it's gonna help give you a better understanding of what you're getting yourself into, and it's gonna sharpen you up a little bit more. Because even when I talk to you. Like, I just didn't see, and I'm just keeping it a buck. I didn't see that seriousness in you. I didn't see it, man. I, I didn't see it. I think you, see, what happens is a lot of people don't take shit serious until they lose all their money. You know, they think it's a joke. This ain't no joke. This is the real world. And, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Finally got the truck and made it low today. Headed to Illinois tomorrow. You made me get on their asses. Oh, so I made you get on their asses. Well, see, I'm glad you got on it, but see, I shouldn't have been the one that forced you to lean on them. You should have been leaning on them at the beginning. You know what I'm saying? Like you give a person five thousand dollars and and you know and. You don't ask any questions, you know, you can't do that, man. You 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 invest into something, you gotta ask questions, you gotta know what you're getting, man. So to give a person five thousand dollars and then go home <laughs> with no idea on when you're gonna get what you paid for it, you know, you can't you can't you can't do that as a business owner, man. So I'm glad that you were able to take that information and it gave you the motivation that you needed to get up and be more proactive so after that conversation i wasn't the same i can't thank you enough for telling me the truth no one was ever honest with me for that i thank you and i listen from now on it's all good man you know it might have seemed a little harsh well maybe it wasn't harsh i don't think it was harsh but it was just you know <sighs> You know, it's hard for me to get into somebody else's mind frame, you know. Um, you know, um, not everybody comes out the gate swinging the same. Um, but I do think that, you know, a lot of people that come into business, you know, they take it serious, but they don't take it as serious as they should. Uh, and some of that may, be, may come from not knowing what to expect. Uh, so when I do those call-ins, you know, it's not, you know, I don't, you know, it, it's not from a place of malice. It's really just to get you in order like, like you did. And it, it, it's a, it's a, it, you know, that accountability, that's a account, that's a character. But I, I see, I see, I saw when I first started that uh, with this guy named James around this time last year. It wasn't 
it was perceived good, but it didn't. It wasn't perceived well by some people. But over time, the results, uh, the results from those accountability sessions are a lot better than you know just doing lectures from a a, a, a six inch monotone voice. People will listen to a six inch monotone voice, right? Uh, and they'll consume the information, but they may not apply it. Uh, uh, they may not apply it. When a person comes up on a one-on-one -on -one and they're faced in front of an audience uh, under accountability and, you know, a lot of the, 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 the points that I be making, when you think about it, and it never hits a person when they going through it. It's always when they go back and rewatch it. When, when the person rewatches it, looking at themselves on the screen, that's when it hits them. And that's when, and that's what I saw got, you know, a better uh, reaction, a more quicker turnaround reaction as far as applying the information and getting on the ball a lot quicker. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I, I do it. I think it's needed. Uh, nobody else is doing it. I've seen people try to do it since I started doing it, but they haven't had success <laughs> like me because I think, you know, you know, people understand why I'm doing, I've been doing it so long now. And then I can come back and do a, a live stream like this where it's not accountability and talk normal. So people understand why and they appreciate it. It's not coming from a place of malice. It's really, it's just really trying to help people out and kind of get them on the ball, you know, sooner than later. So, uh, how long do we have to book the one-on-one -on -one before you shut it down? I don't know. Um, whenever I get time to close the website down, I just, I think I am going to go ahead and shut it down. Um, and the reason why it's, it's, it's not the fact that I just don't want to do it, <laughs> which I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep it funky with you. Um, I think out of all the ones I've did, maybe only a handful of people, I believe really, you know, I think people come to a coaching session, like like a coaching session, the business is not like, you know, coming to get answers. Like it's not like, oh, hey, I booked a session to find out what's the answer for one plus one equals two. So what happens is a lot of people come and they 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 expect answers that are going to get them immediate results. And what happens is I find out what their situation is and I have to correct their behavior and the shit that they came for. Like you're not even at that point. You're not even at that point. So it becomes almost like an accountability session on a call call in. You know what I'm saying? And I and I just, I don't want to do it. You know, I just feel like a lot of people need to really just start from the beginning and start over fresh the correct way. Uh, so it, it, it it's, you know, a lot of times it just be, um, it just be depressing to me, man. I feel like, you know, with me just coming on doing the live streams, you know, people just gonna have to catch these live streams and apply. I've, I've given great information, and if you really want that one on one, yeah, you are gonna have to come to a call in show. You know, it's gonna be free, but you're gonna be held accountable, and you're gonna be placed on display in front of everybody. Now, you know, it, it is what it is, but that gets results. So, as far as me shutting it down, I don't know. Maybe this month, maybe next month, whenever I can get a chance to log in and you know do it i'm gonna do it what up mark what do you think of taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company stock and when is the next members only live got a few questions on strategy i just had one right before i had this one might do one probably in tomorrow or the day after uh what do i think about the semiconductor manufacturing companies i invested into some um a few years ago but i've pulled out of those investments um 
right now I I just don't see you know the only way I'm going to invest into that niche is if that niche becomes um popularized um I don't see my money really growing in that niche um at a rate that I would want it to grow at it's not a magnific magnificent, magnificent seven type of play. It's not a long term play for me where I feel like my money, you know, dollar cost averaging into that over a period of time is going to benefit me. It's not a short term play. So, no, if I'm going to invest in to that, I'd rather just invest into AI. Instead of me investing into semiconductor chips, I'd rather just put that money into NVIDIA and just dollar cost averaging into into nvidia um so that's just me i'm not really big on the semi-conductor chip investment narrative not at the current moment not at the current moment uh 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 let me see can you get a date on what? 24 carry roses. What what you want a date for? A, what type of date? Great live. Thank you as always. Now I'm all worked up about Chicago and this culture. Yeah, Chicago, a beautiful city with a lot of culture. You know what I'm saying? So listen, if you can make it in cities like Chicago and New York and LA, you can make it anywhere, man. So for you like you, Costas, you made it here. You've been successful here. Like you can make it here again. You can make it anywhere again. It's a play right now that I want to talk about so bad, but I'm not going to talk about it. I think it's a way a lot of people can make money. I might talk about it in the members only, uh, but you never know who's watching. You know what I'm saying? Like I like some of the people that watch me, I would have never thought they watched me. You know until they DM me. You know what I'm saying? They're not going to say nothing in the chat, but it's a lot of people that watch me quietly. With a lot of money, celebrities, ball players, shit like that. So this shit that I'm that I got right now, that I'm thinking about, like this shit doesn't require any labor. Once the infrastructure is built, which is really not, it's AI driven. And if I tell some people this shit, you're gonna be like, why didn't I think of that? I'll talk about it after I finish doing it. And it's it's a money pit. When I'm telling you it's money on auto. On autopilot, it's money on autopilot. And you wouldn't, be, like, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Thinking outside the box, being an early adapter before other people come into the market, get your money, get out, let other people fight when the competition is increased, and you take your money and you chasing the next thing and keep it moving. But I'm going to talk about, I'll probably talk about it in the members only, man. I'll probably talk about it in the members only, man. All right, man. I'm out of here, bro. I'm finna go to bed. All right. Tomorrow's Thursday. I may do a show tomorrow. If not, I spent three and a half hours, so I made up for the six days. I didn't do a live stream, so I made up with it. I did a three and a half hour. Talk about the next members only. I might talk about it. I got to talk about real world assets, though, on the next private members only. We got to get into real, real world assets. We got to get into base. We got to get into base chain layer two uh, built on Ethereum because I think that's the next. Well, I know that's the next big way. A lot of money that would be going into Solana is starting to go into base. So some people I know listen, they don't know what we're talking about, but I'm going to talk about base layer two um, on the next live stream. We're going to talk about real world assets on the next members only live stream. So. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about that. All right, so all right, man. See y'all. Anton said, Brett, listen. Anton, is Anton a member? Yeah, he a member. Yeah, Brett, I, 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 I'm trying to get a big bag of Brett, but man, I, I, the Ethereum, man. I wish Brett was on an exchange because I would just buy it on the exchange and leave it on the exchange. I'm just worried that if I buy a big bag of Brett, how much in gas fees is it gonna cost me? Like that's I I hate I hate 
See, now when we talking about money, see, now I get to talking again, man. I hate, I just hate the gas fees, man. I hate gas fees. I hate that Ethereum has, has, have high gas fees. I hate it. And that deters me from investing to a lot of coins that I can't purchase on the exchange that I have to get out of a wallet and pay high gas fees for, like. But bread, I'm I'm probably gonna pick up a nice big bag of bread. I picked up some aerodrome today. I'm actually gonna buy some more right now before I go to bed. So um all right, y'all. See y'all in the next one. Peace. <laughs>